Alright, so three months ago I made a video about the fact that I started reading the Cosmere books and I started with The Final Empire, which was the first Mistborn book. Um, and now I have totally finished all of the Mistborn books. I have read Era 2 now, and that includes Secret History. I've not read the 11th Metal, but it doesn't really seem that necessary to do so. I might do it at some point, but I currently haven't. Um, and I know this is not like the way or the reading order uh, when it comes to reading Brandon Sanderson's books because obviously this book is supposedly the most Cosmere aware book basically in the entire Cosmere so far. That being said, I don't really think personally that me having not read the other books affected my experience that much, though I guess I can't really say that for sure because I've not read them. There were definitely some things that happened in the last book that I didn't really understand, but generally, you know, I will be reading the books in the order I want to read them, not in the read them, not in the order that uh, people think is best. Um, I did not want to stop reading the Mistborn books and go and read the Stormlargo books. I wanted to read all the Mistborn books before I stopped, and so I did. So that's where we are with these. The Lost Metal. I have finished it. And, I mean, we'll skip straight to it. These books fucking slap, and they're great. Uh, <laughs> uh, but having finished these books now, uh, all of the Mistborn books, I will be going on a Brandon Sanderson detox. I will be taking a break. These are all quite long books, apart from the first couple of Era 2 Mistborn books. Obviously the original trilogy is quite long, and this book itself is not a short book really, about 450 pages long. So I'm going to go on to read the Murderbot Diaries as kind of a palate cleanser, as kind of an in-betweener. And then I'll be returning to Brandon Sanderson, and I'll be tackling the Stormlight Archives finally. Um, uh, but this video is about Mistborn Era 2, so that's what I'm going to talk about. So, Mistborn Era 2 was the reason I started reading Brandon Sanderson's books. Now, obviously people... The most common thing I'd heard about Brandon Sanderson is that the Stormlark was really good. Now, um, and a couple of my friends had read the Mistborn books and had basically recommended them to me. Um, but the thing that really got me to read his books was Era 2. And what I mean by that is I'd heard that Brandon Sanson was doing this kind of writing experiment, which was that you would get a fancy setting and you would write a, bun a trilogy of trilogies where it moved through the different ages, um, starting with this kind of antiquity era, then a modern era, and then a kind of sci-fi space age. And... Looking back, that I just thought was the coolest fucking idea ever. <laughs> um, I, to this day, personally think the fantasy is like super limited. Um, fantasy authors always seem to just write around a medieval period. They never they they'll they'll push into a Renaissance era. Very rarely you get into like a colonial type era kind of fantasy, but you never really get um, a modern age with firearms like they've done here. And it's very rare. Um, and I think that's a massive blind spot of fantasy, in my opinion. I think that um, you could easily do a fantasy that's set in a modern world. I don't know why that never gets done. I don't know why people think that it's easier to make an urban fantasy series and just set it in our world and not just make a fictional world that's technologically basically identical to the real world. I don't see why you couldn't, why you couldn't do that, um, but it's, I've just never really seen it done, and I want to see it done. Uh, so basically, that's why I started reading Brandis Anderson. And I'll just tell you what, he fucking blew this out of the water. He knocked this out of the park. Um, seeing all the magic, I'll go into detail later, but seeing all the magic systems and the continuation of the legend of some of the characters from the original trilogy continue on 300 years later in 
you know, the world of, at the end of the original trilogy, the world of Scadrial was changed forever. It's unrecognisable. It's barely the same planet. Um, so, you know, seeing things change the way they did, absolutely phenomenal. I've never seen any author do anything like this, and I think Brandon Sanson did a fucking amazing job, and he deserves credit for this, because this is something that in, to my understanding, is totally original. No one's done anything like this before. Not that I think originality is the be-all and end-all of quality or anything like that. Not at all. Uh, I think the opposite, generally. But um, this, the, after finishing these books, I cannot wait to see what um, I think it's like a 1980s kind of style world with like computers and one of the main characters is going to be a computer programmer that sounds so fucking cool and I cannot wait to see that I really can't wait to see that so <laughs> these books did not disappoint um, I, I'm not going to say I enjoyed these books more than the original trilogy um, I, you know they are good. They are good in different ways. Um, I love the original trilogy. Um, I think it had an incredible ending. Um, and these books are incredible in their own way. And the very, very... I don't want to compare them to the original trilogy. Because they're not really comparable. They're very, very different. Um, and each book is kind of its own genre. So... You know, like the first book is a western, the second one's a thriller, the third one's kind of an adventure, and then the fourth one isn't really, doesn't really go into any particular genre, but it's just kind of wrapping it up. Um, and I thought that was that was all really well done. Um, this will not be a spoiler-free video. Uh, there is your warning. This will not be spoiler-free. Okay, I will be talking about my thoughts of the books. I may even speak about the ending of the last book in like straight away, so I, I don't recommend continuing further into this video if you have not seen these, if you've not read these books before. I will say now, if you have not, before you leave, read them. They're fucking awesome. Um, they're they're great. Uh, they they do something that nobody really does except an urban fantasy they blend revolvers and guns with magic and uh brand Sasson did a really fucking good job of that and alamancy is kind alamancy and farakami they're kind of the perfect kinds of magic systems to blend with uh firearms and modern technology um and that's all really well done here so that's my that's my overall thoughts. If you if you don't want to watch the rest of the video, they're great. Go read them. Um, they're fucking awesome. I will now go on to talking about what I liked about the books. Um, this will probably be one of my longer videos, uh, which is saying something because a lot they tend to be about an hour long. Um, I will be talking about all of the books in one video, and the reason for that is because I didn't want to make a video in between the books. Uh, which I might do with the Stormlight Archives because they're fucking huge. But as it stands, I just wanted to do one book for the whole uh, quadrilogy. So, that'll do it for the intro. And I'm going to move on to documenting what I liked about these books. So, I'll start off with like a general thing. I'll talk generally about the books if um, in the general sense. So, I want to say I liked all the books. Um, in order of favourite to least favourite, uh, probably my favourite would be Shadows of Self, um, followed by Bands of Mourning, Lost Metal, and then the Alloy of Law. Um, they're all fairly close, with the exception of Alloy of Law, you know, unsurprisingly, being my least favourite um, by quite a margin. Uh, Alley of Law is probably my least favourite Mistborn book overall. Not to say it's a bad book. It's not. It's not a bad book. Um, I, I don't want to give the impression that it's bad at all. It's still a good book, but it's very short. It's very to the point. Um, it's kind of a western style, like you know, sheriff hunts down and kills uh, a bad guy, and he's get taken down. Um, but I thought as setup, 
for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the series. It was very good. Um, I understand the origins of this book is that the Alloy of Law is supposed to be a one-off in between the first era and what's supposed to be the second era, which will now be the third era. Um, kind of like exper writing experiment type thing, kind of a one-off like in between. Uh, thing to kind of give people an idea of what the world would have been like just before the computer age, basically. Um, and I thought that, you know, it did the job. Um, it did the job, and I understand why Brandon Sands fell in love with those characters and why he went on to write an entire, um, an entire series, uh, an entire era of Mistborn around these characters because, you know. Wax and Wayne specifically, although they were very simplistic characters, um, but very straight to the point, um, kind of, Wax is the only character who really had a character arc in that book, um, you know, they were pretty straight to the point, and I, you know, I thought that um, it was a great start um, overall. But it was the worst book of the series, and you could definitely tell that it was supposed to be a one-off thing. Um, kind of, because it did feel like there was setup in there, you know? Like, Miles dying at the end, and kind of like saying, Oh yeah, fuck you all, you're, you're gonna die, because the, the person is gonna turn up. He did the Lord Genome thing, where he's like, Haha, jokes on you guys, you may have killed me, but I'm just the first wave, um, kind of thing. Um, being all cryptic, talking about how they're going to get fucked up by Trail. Um, and you know, that felt like setup. Now, I don't know if Brandon Sanderson had decided by the end of writing the first book that he was going to write more, or if it was after the first book. Because if it was during the first book, it you know, the setup would m make sense, um, and you can see it. Uh, but it definitely does suffer from the fact that it does feel like it was supposed to be a one-off. Specifically Marasi. Um, she is overall, I think, a fucking great character. Um, Brandon Sanson added again writing fucking great female characters even though he's a dude. Gotta give the guy credit, like he's really fucking good at that. Um, but... She just kind of was there and she wanted to fuck Wax, and that was her character. Uh, in the first book, she was a very, you know, I liked that her power, her useless power, saved the day in the end. And, you know, it felt like the end of the book evolved her as a character by a step or two. But overall, she felt like a very weak character throughout the whole thing. Um, I kind of dreaded her viewpoint chapters, because they just seemed kind of, they just seemed kind of shit. Um, they were just kind of boring, uh, and she was kind of boring from to read from the perspective of uh, in the first book. So you know the the first book wasn't perfect, but I still liked it. I still thought it was a good book. Um, the second book, uh, people probably gonna be surprised there, was my favorite of the whole trilogy, uh, the whole series, not a trilogy, it's a quadrilogy, the whole of the whole series. Um, now, the reason for this was because I thought that, for me, I'm a very character-driven person. Um, I don't care about a story unless the characters are seriously in their, their arcs and their beliefs and who they are is heavily intertwined with that story. Um, for me, plot is just a thing to justify pushing characters towards development. Um, that's the that's the value and goal of all of the characters and uh, all the side characters and the villain, and that's kind of how I see. Uh, that's that's how I prefer my storytelling um, as a, as a as a consumer. And you know, the thing is, is this book felt like the the most like that. Of, all, of the entire um, of all the books, um, Wax was a, a, the ending of this book was a life-defining <laughs> event for Wax, and um, a life-changing event for e basically everyone involved, um, apart from Wayne, maybe. Uh, the ending of this book of Shadows of Self made me tear up. Um, and it was rough. Like I really felt for Wax at the end of that book, and it kicked off um, 
a character arc that I thought was really good, which was, you know, Waxer's basically losing his faith um, and struggling to, to understand why things are the way they are, why Harmony uh, says would do what he did to him and the people he loved. And overall, I just thought the emotional impact of that book was so much higher than any of the others. Uh, it felt like, you know, it felt like Wax's character defining moment was when he shot, um, when he shot Lassie and Gilda was, you know, making him relive that moment at the start of the very first book. I don't know, I just thought it was brilliant character writing. I thought, you know, that I wasn't mass a massive fan of Wax until the end of this book. And Wax became one of my favourite characters in Mistborn, in the Mistborn books, straight up. So you know, that's that's all that I really need to say. I just think that the ending of this book was the best ending of all the books. Um even if it was a bit predictable, I've heard from other people. I didn't predict it. So, for me, it was it really caught me off guard, and you know, I, I just it just really hit me hard. Uh, I really felt for Wax, and I really connected with him as a character, as a character in that moment, and that's when I really decided I liked these books. Like I really liked these books, and I was I was definitely in for the ride, like fully, from that point on. Then. The um, the Bands of Mourning being my next favourite of uh, of the series, I thought overall this book was a bit meandering. Um, I do think that is an issue with all of these books, with the exception of the first one, ironically, um, Alloy of Law, because they all do kind of feel like they just kind of go on and the characters are on the back foot and then they just get a hold of the head of the villain and just kick the villain's ass. That's kind of how these books go. Um, and the thing is, is <laughs> the stakes in this book, even though the characters are weaker, feel lower on, on, on a character perspective, from a character perspective for me. Um, and that kind of felt at its peak in the third book. That being said, the third book had some of the most emotionally hitting scenes of the whole series. Um, Wayne's reaction to Wax dying uh, fucking choked me up, not gonna lie. Um, I thought that... Um, I'll talk more about Wayne later, but I think Wayne is, is just far and away the best character in these books. Um... But, you know, Wayne's reaction to Wax dying was just, that, that fucking, that hit me in the feelies real hard. And that was kind of the moment where I really connected with Wayne as a character. And, um, that, you know, for that reason, this book will be my second favourite. Uh, just because I think it's a bit slow. It's a bit slow and, like... I thought it was the most predictable. I guessed what the bands of mourning were. Like, as soon as they, as soon as um, Wax was like, "Yeah, there's something weird about all these these traps and stuff." This seems like a lot of effort. You know, this seems like a like a like a hoax. And then Wayne happened to pull the spear off the end. And I was like, "Oh, that's gonna be the fucking bands of mourning." Um, I. It took me a while to understand why it's called the Bands of Mourning. I was like, if they're not armbands, what are they? And then I was like, oh yeah, it's because the it's like bands of metal like strapped together. It's like a spearhead made out of loads of different layers of different metals, and that's why it's called the Bands of Mourning, I assume. Um, I think overall the book, yeah, it was it was a bit slow, um, but it was also the book where Steris really came out of her shell. And Steris went on to be one of the best characters uh, in the Mistborn books in general. I think Steris is... I, I have a lot to say about the characters in these books. I really think the characters are the strongest element of these books. And this is one of the reasons I love them so much. Um, the whole cast is great. Uh, uh, you know, 
and these the, the I don't really want to rank them, but you know the the th overall I have to say that the Vans of Morning I thought was not as good as the um, Shadows of Self, just because I thought it just kind of went on for a bit, and I didn't think the mystery the, the kind of like finding finding where the bands were was very interesting. Um, I thought the world building elements of this book were really good. I really think it it really expanded the world of literally um, really expanded the world with the realization that there's an entire other continent with other people and obviously the hint at the end which was that um that Kelsey is not dead uh, and then my least favorite was sorry the next would be the alloy of law if notice the last one it's still a fucking great book um, and it has obviously the ending with uh, Wayne's sacrifice being fucking a massively emotionally hard hitting scene. Um, Wayne just what a character, but the thing that really annoyed me about this book is it was just really fucking slow. I don't know if anyone else had this experience with this book. I think this is the slowest of all the Mistborn books. Because nothing really plot relevant happens until the last third of the book at all. Like it's the thing is all the other all the other books feel like there's a lot of setup. And there might have been a lot of setup in this book and I might have just missed it. But for me, it just felt like a lot of nothing happened in this book. Um, compared to the others, I still thought it was a fucking great book. Um, there's, it, you know, dis or despite that, these books, even when the plot doesn't feel like it's moving forward, or the story doesn't feel like it's being pushed forward, these books are filled with continuous character moments that make the books great to read, even if if they feel like then the story isn't moving forward at all. Like as I'm a very character driven reader, these these books, they they are absolutely amazing from a character perspective all the characters are continuously evolving and going through an arc and you know this book although it had some of the best character bits in it the plot really was just fucking really slow <laughs> um you know and and that's why i've i've got to put it at third for me um it was it was a great book still but it was very slow uh, and then obviously my least favourite, unsurprisingly, being the Alloy of Law. Um, I think I spoke, I've spoken about the Alloy of Law plenty. Um, you know, it's just it's just not got that much going for it, unfortunately. It's a cool little short read. Cool little short romp. Um, the only thing this book does really well, which all the books do from that point onwards, uh, is the world building. Um, it's a really good introduction to how the world is now. Um, and it kicks off the character arcs, uh, but it doesn't really do anything else. So it's just not it's just not that great compared to the other. Still a good book, um, but I do think these these books do in general suffer from the fact that they begin weaker. They have a much weaker beginning than the the final empire because the thing about the final empire is you're fresh off the boat this is a brand new world um when you're uh, when when you first read the first the, the first Mistborn book you've never you don't know anything about Mistborn every little thing about Alamancy is super new and super interesting and super cool uh, that is not the case in these books uh, you already know everything about Alamancy there are no characters in this books who are Mistborn Okay, none of the, not a single character is a misborn. Not even Kelsey is a misborn anymore. So this has, you know, the it feels completely different to read because everyone is either twin born or just a metal born of some description. So, you know, it's not introducing anything new, really. I mean, I suppose the twin born are kind of new. Wax, I'm mean, obviously Wax is doing really fucking cool shit. Um, there are pulses and. I don't know what the other one's called sliders, um, but you knew. But that's it, really, uh, from from the from the magic system perspective. To start off with, of course, uh, the magic system continues to evolve uh, in these books, as does your understanding of it. But overall, 
starts off pretty weak, I think, but really, really ramps up um, in the second book. So overall, I liked all the books. I think they're great. Uh, I think you should go. I think you know I, they're all good books. Uh, I've seen people say that they find these ones boring compared to the others. I think that's fucking crazy. To most, that's crazy because uh, these um. I mean, I suppose if you're not, like, the kind of person like me who just cares about good cast of characters and everything else comes completely secondary, I, I will take a two-star plot. If it's the most boring, done-to-death plot ever, I don't care as long as the, there's a good reason for the characters to be invested in it and for it to put them through the ringer and for them to come out different at the end. That's all I really care about. And these books all do that. Every single one of them does that. So, you know... For me, I can't complain. These uh, these books are great. Uh, every single one of them is good, even though they are not all equal, in my opinion. Uh, so, what I liked to start off with the books, all of them, pretty much every single one. Next, I want to talk about this one secret history because it's a bit of a weird one for me. Um, I liked it. I read it all in one sitting. Uh, in an evening. Um, I thought it was really cool. Um, and I, I read it after Bands of Morning, um, which is when I, I was recommended to read it. And, uh, you know, I actually strongly disagree with that suggestion of that being when you should read it. I think you should read it after the original um, the original trilogy. I think you should read it at the end of Era 1. Um, and the reason for that is because the reveal that kills you isn't dead. Um... The implication that he isn't dead at the end of three um, falls completely fucking flat, in my opinion. It's it's not a core cool reveal. It, 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 the only reason it, there's even an implication that could be Kelsia uh, is because they say survive. That that is the only the only implication. I, I think that that scene would have been so much cooler. If you knew Kelsey was alive, and then you read that, and you were like, "Holy shit, Kelsey is gonna be coming back! Holy fuck, that's cool!" Because you don't see in Secret History, you don't see Kelsey ever return to the land of the living. He doesn't ever get a physical body back, and the reveal that he's back in the physical realm and not in the cognitive realm would have been a really cool reveal at the end of that book, I think. And otherwise, it just kind of falls flat, and it's not a very good reveal, and it's kind of like, eh. However, I think if you've already read Secret History, this shit would be cool as hell. It will be such so cool. So I, I actually think I don't agree. I think you should read the original trilogy, then Secret History, then go on to read the rest of um, the rest of the the Bolt Era Two. What did I think of Secret History? I thought Secret History was good. Uh, I thought it was really cool. Um, it was really cool to see Kelsier again. It was really cool to see Preservation dying off. It gave characterization, uh, gave Preservation the characterization they desperately needed. Preservation was a character, and we never really see anything about them. We just see the Mist Spirit and them kind of try their best to muddle and try and get people to understand some stuff. You know. Uh, the reveal that um, Preservation didn't ki try and kill Ellen, it was actually Kelsey who grabbed Preservation's arm and did it for him. That was a really cool reveal, I thought a really cool detail, because I always thought it was a bit of a plot hole. Because Preservation, in theory, because of how the way intent works to my understanding, doesn't really make sense to me that Preservation would be able to directly kill someone. Um, so I think the, you know, that was that was a really good way of explaining how that happened. Um, I thought the Cognitive Realm stuff was really cool. Uh, I thought the, the Cognitive Realm, from like just an imagining it perspective, is really fucking cool. I thought it was really cool how Kelsier like, div like learned new abilities. He learned how to like push through physical objects so that you could get around faster. He learned how to observe things by like looking at the souls of individuals, he learned how to like 
make his way in this world by like taking memories or like remnants of ideas of things that existed in the physical world and then picking them up and then using those as objects that was really fucking cool um i thought the in general the characterization of kelsier in the book was really 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 good it really really hit hard when um when preservation died, I actually hit really hard. Um, I, I I really felt that, uh, and you know, I thought Kelsey's whole kind of arc in this book was really cool about him just kind of like not giving up. Him, he, you know, him being his old self. He's he's kind of you know he's kind of a prick, isn't he, Kelsey? He's kind of um, kind of a morally great character, um, but we love him anyway. The thing is, his his flaws are many, but his virtues. are to and you can't help but kind of respect the guy his heart's in the right place and if it weren't for him things might not have worked out in a in you know in the original trilogy and it was really cool to see how he influenced events even after his death and at the end of the original trilogy when Vin and Ellen die you do get um, obviously, Harmony says says to um, to Spook that he's spoken to both of them and that they aren't that um, they're happily moved on and all that stuff. Um, you see that happen. That you see that scene. Um, and I read this book months after after the original trilogy. So I read the I read Era One. And it ripped my fucking heart out. And then I read this scene again uh, from Kelsey's perspective, and it did it again. Um, I try not to cry when when I read the scene again. Um, it was really emotional, and it really hit me really fucking hard. Um, it was great. It was it was you know fuck you, Brandon Sanson, for making me relive that, but. Um, you know, seeing them meet again and seeing, like, Vin begrudging... Uh, not Vin, sorry. Uh, Kelsey begrudgingly have developed some respect and acceptance of Ellen, despite the fact that he was a noble. And, you know, seeing Kelsey uh, talk to Vin again and Vin basically having grown beyond the need for Kelsey and what he thinks. And him, like, trying to get her to stay and her leaving. Um... Or just great characterization in general. I would, you know, that's exactly what I would expect Kelsey to do. He's selfish. I would expect him to want, um, want Vin to stay. Uh, obviously, we know that she decided to move on with uh, with Ellen to whatever comes next. And also, Kelsey's uh, little interaction with Says was pretty cool. Um, and then at the end, when he's talking with. Uh, Talking with Spook about like using a hemology was, I thought, pretty fucking cool. Um, so yeah, overall, I think it's a great book. I just don't agree that you should read it. Um, I don't think you should. I really just don't think you should read it after the third book. I don't think it adds anything to the third book um, after you've read it. But it does if you had it add a lot to the third book if you've read it before. So I think you should read it before. Um, but that's my thoughts on Secret History. I thought it's a cool little novella. It's great. Adds a lot of context. Um, it's just great seeing Kelsier again. Um, who doesn't love Kelsier? Um, the whole thing was just was just very solid, and I don't really have any complaints about it. Um, yeah. The only thing that I didn't like that much about it was the last third of it, when Kelsier like just fucks off to. The middle of fucking nowhere, and then he just like steals this orb that lets him absorb, that lets him basically become the bearer of preservation for a short time. I I don't fucking get how that works. I I, I mean that's probably my lack of cosmic understanding. Obviously, I know what Dora is now. Having finished the Lost Metal, it's basically unattuned investiture it's just pure investiture um and obviously it can be used to power all the different magic systems in um in the cosmos but i don't really get how that orb really 
factored into that. I don't really get how just having a bit of pure investiture allowed um, Kelsia to become uh, to use preservation's power as a cognitive shadow. I don't really understand how that worked, but I guess it's good, partially a mixture of the fact that he went into the Well of Ascension. Also, the Hoid thing was really cool. I don't fucking know who this Hoid MF is. Like, he, he's turning up. Um, but I, I have the suspicion that not all the Hoids are Hoid, if that makes sense. The Some of the, the Hoids... Like, Preservation refers to Hoid by a name, and I can't remember what it was, it begins with C, I think. That's Hoid's actual name. Hoid is just, I think Hoid is just a, a name that he goes by, that he uses. And I think it's probably going to turn out to just be like a common name. Like it would just be like, oh yeah, Hoid's just a common name, innit? You get it, it's, it's a common name everywhere. You get it in, you get it on Roshar, you get it on Scadrial. For some reason, it's just a common name all over the whole fucking Cosmere, for, which makes no fucking sense to me, but um, all over the Cosmere. So they're not all the Hoids on Hoid. And it'll be like, oh, okay. But that Hoid that came swimming through, um, came swimming through and took a bead of Lorazium, that's the Hoid, I imagine. I imagine the Hoid, uh, is a misborn now. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. <clears throat> that's, that's all I have to say about it. It's, it's good. It was good. So, I have to talk about the characters. Because the characters are, I mean, to put it bluntly, the characters are the best thing about these books, uh, for me. Um, the whole cast, that is Wax, Wayne, Marasi, and Steris, and Milan, I guess, as well, who would count to be, like, the main cast, um, the most common characters throughout the series, and Sazed, we'll say Sazed and Harmony as well. Um, it's just great. Uh, the, the character growth in these books, um, the characters go through a lot of shit and, uh, they go through periods of not being sure about themselves, being unsure of what they want, being unsure of who they are, and by the end of the book, end of the series all the characters are basically the, the ultimate versions of themselves and this is basically ultimately what I want to see from character writing in general if you're gonna finish a series you might as well have the characters be the best versions of themselves that they can be by the end of your story and I think that you know they should still be flawed, but they should, ha you know, finally be confident and sure in who they are, at the very least, and know their place in the world, what they stand for, and basically, that's all really important because at that point, the reader has a total understanding of that character, that person, and who they are. <laughs> And you can continue to use that character, just not as a main character, I think, throughout uh, in in the future, if you want, as like a side character who turns up, right? Um, but not as a main character, because their development is done. They've become who they're meant to be, and that's when they cease to have any narrative value, so to speak. Uh, that's when you either kill them off or you sideline them because uh, the story's done. And, you know, both are a perfectly valid approach uh, to to dealing with a character. Usually you want to line this kind of perfection of their character arc at the end of a story. Um, you, you can do it earlier in, but then you have to kind of like remove that character somehow or from the story or sideline them in a way that doesn't feel like they're being sidelined in a way that feels appropriate and also you know you can kill them off I think all the characters in this book meet that criteria personally um, 
with the exception of Sazed, because he's kind of going, he's kind of going through some shit, and he's not really a main character. There's nothing from his perspective ever in this book. He's just a character who we see through the lens of other characters. Obviously, Wax worships him, and he's the only one who really talks to him apart from Kelsier. So, you know. I will talk about Sazed. I think Sazed is great in this book for other reasons than what I previously just stated about what I think makes great character and makes great character writing and good character arcs. And I'll basically go over each of the main cast and I'm going to explain what I liked about them and why I thought they were great. So, first character that I want to talk about is Wax, the de facto main character of this book. He has more screen time than any other character. I believe. At least that's what it feels like. Followed by Wayne, and then Marassi, I think. And I like Wa uh, Wax for the same reason that I like Vin. Because he has a very similar journey to Vin in these books. Where he comes to all these different parts of who he is come together. And he learns to be all of them at once. Um, and it's, you know, a tried and tested character arc. That's been done before. I mean, Brandon did it before in the previous books with, with the main character, I mean effectively the two main characters in these two books have the same character arc. But the difference being, main difference being that Wags is basically a paladin. He's a paladin who is going through a crisis of faith and um, that's a character arc that I just will never get bored of. That's all I have to say about Wax really um, from from the personal perspective. I think, he was, I think he was a great character, I wasn't super on board with him right off the bat. But around the, I I liked him. I thought it was cool enough. But it's 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 nice to have a character who's like obsessed with justice and whatnot. I mean, I do like the character. I do like the Paladin trope. You know, I recently played Baldur's Gate three, and I played as a goody two shoes Paladin throughout the whole game. I loved every fucking second of it. And this is basically what Wax is. Wax kills b fucking evil people, and he does it well. Uh, and then obviously he has his issues around that. I thought it was just a really fucking cool character. Him and Wayne just perfectly... It's a very generic, tropey character um, relationship of the straight guy and the funny guy, and it just... It's just done so well here. It, it works. It's it's really good. Wax and Steris's relationship. I'll talk more about that later, but was great. And then, just his capabilities as a character, as an Alamancer, uh, a twin born. I thought making the main character a steel pusher, a coin shot, was an absolutely genius idea for a setting where the main main weapon, uh, primary use of a weapon, is conventional firearms. Because being able to steel push gives you insane mobility and also just the ability to push bullets away from you to make to alter the trajectory of bullets. I mean, it would not have been believable that Wax survived this entire series if it wasn't for his ability to make a bubble around himself, to prevent himself from being shot. And there's just some really cool stuff that he's able to do by mixing the fact that he can uh, tap iron, I think it's iron, and use steel, uh, burn steel, because obviously with with pushing, your weight is basically the, the determining factor of whether or not you're pushed away from something or something is pushed away from you, and being able to alter that variable uh, as he sees fit is just kind of a no-brainer and a really cool combination. And you now it's a combination that makes him insanely fucking powerful, considering he's not a misborn. None of the characters in these books, unless you include Wayne right at the end, is a misborn, and he still feels like an absolute powerhouse an absolute badass, and I think Brandon Sanderson did a really good job there with this character. Um, I really liked Wax. So, Wayne is the secondary protagonist, I suppose you could call him, of this series. He is a comic relief character, but he's so much more than that. He's very funny, um, obviously. He's absolutely hilarious. I once saw Brandon Sanderson say, I watched a video where him and Joe Abercrombie were in the same, were in a podcast together, and they were talking about like what they are jealous of the other writer about. 
And Brandon Sanderson said, I wish I was as funny as Joe Abercrombie. Well, with Wayne, he's as funny as Joe Abercrombie. He's hilarious. Wayne is so fucking funny. And he's so charismatic. And he's so likeable. And his character arc is, again, a very simple tried and tested character arc. And it's a character arc of redemption. Of finding forgiveness for something bad that one has done. And it's been done a million times, and it was done so fucking well in these books. Um, I do think it was a bit backloaded. I think the vast majority of Wayne's development as a character was just in the last book, unfortunately. Um, that being said, he did kind of make small steps toward realizing the, making the simple realization, which is that he is not a bad person. He's he's just a person who's done bad things. And he was given a second chance by Wax. Um and goddamn does he does he use it? Um he's his powers are really cool. His um I mean as a person sorry, getting distracted as a character, I loved him. I thought he was great. He was probably my favourite character. Of this uh, entire trilogy, entire I keep saying trilogy, entire series of books. Um, there's something to be said about character writing. There's multiple ways to write a good character. You can write a super in-depth, multifaceted character, and people will like them for that. But you can just make a character who's really fucking likable and genuine, and a character that you really empathise with. Wayne's self-loathing, I think, is something a lot of people can empathise with can sympathize with very strongly and that's really going to carry a lot of people through these books. Wayne is going to carry a lot of people through these books even if they don't like them as much as the original trilogy I think. Wayne was just a phenomenal character and the chapters from his perspective were so fucking good. There's a chapter in the in um, Bands of Morning when he basically has a chat with Marasi and they basically he comes to the conclusion that he has to move on from being obsessed with Renette. And he just basically just... I don't know what other term to use other than rampages through the city um, by just bullshitting his way from A to B. Doesn't pay a single penny to to go from one side of the city to the other. Um, trades a bunch of random items. Of ran trades, of course. A bunch of random objects with random people and then just gives what you finally ended up with to Renette. And then there's this really, really heartfelt scene where Wayne kind of... Just, just moves on, and it was, it was such a simple thing. It's such a simple thing to, uh, to move on from, from putting someone up on a pedestal who, who romantically you are obsessed with and who you love, uh, and accept that that person is never going to feel the same way about you, and to move on with your life is a difficult thing to do, and it was, it was very eloquently pre presented um, to us, the readers. I thought in this book and another thing that i want to say about wayne is wayne is he's always being silly and over the top but that makes the moments when he's not being like that so much more poignant and so much hit so much harder um wayne's reaction to wax dying in bands of morning was an extremely hard-hitting emotional scene for me i found just a description of wayne just breaking down and like running his hands through his hair and like sobbing and just like pan basically panicking because wax is basically his whole fucking life like wax is his everything in um in this book and in the in these series and i mean wax is basically his father um, I, this, is a, this is the thing that um, the thing that I'm a bit I'll go back in the in the bad section for this a bit more but I think it's a real shame that Brandon Sanderson didn't take more time to explore the fact that their relationship is very much like um, like father and son because Wayne never had a dad Wax basically was that figure in his life for him he taught him right from wrong and I really think that was underexplored um, unfortunately, uh, obviously they're not literally father and son, but they have that father and son kind of bond. Um, I suppose it's more brotherly, I guess, but they do have a similar relationship. It's kind of like the relationship between Harry 
and Michael Carpenter in The Dresden Files, which is a dynamic that I really like. Um, a pair of characters whose relationship is, I think, extremely well written. And this is, I, mean, I think it's a shame that that facet of their relationship wasn't explored more. Um, but, you know, th these books are shorter, they have less time to do these things in. His, for his powers, it was pretty cool to have a character who used melee weapons in combat versus guns. Obviously, Wayne has the quirk where he can't use guns because of the trauma of the fact that he shot someone with one. Um, kind of stretched my suspension of disbelief a bit sometimes when... Um, he kind of just didn't get gunned down all the time. I feel like if you go into a bubble where no one can see where you are, and the bubble's about six foot across, any like decent marksman will be able to basically get ready to take you out on either side of that bubble that you come out of. I don't think it's that big of a... I don't think it would be... It would definitely make it harder for you to be shot. Of that, I have no doubt. But I don't think it was the... I don't see it as being this, like anathema to being shot like the, like the like the books make it out to be and again it's one of the weaker things i usually i think brandon sanson is really good at writing fight scenes i feel like they they're going realistically in terms of injury um and it's kind of hard to do that with wayne because he's a blood maker and he can heal but seeing him just kind of go into a speed bubble and just avoid being shot when he came out of one, I don't know that that that, that stretches my suspension of disbelief a little bit. That, and there is there is a gap in between using um, making a speed bubble and making another one. So I don't know that that was a bit of a that was not really an issue with Wayne's character, but just one of those things that kind of stretched my suspension of disbelief. But otherwise, Wayne was I think the standout character. I think there's no doubt about that. Uh, I think most people will agree Wayne is the best character in this series, in this series, and I think Brandon Sanderson knew that too. And I think that's why he made Wayne make the ultimate sacrifice at the end, because he knew that it would be so much, it would be just more effective for tugging at our heartstrings to have Wayne die than Wax. So Wayne, Wayne is a character that I really, really liked. And next we'll talk about Marasi. Marasi. Was my least favorite character in the first book. I think, apart from the little bit of evolution she has, she has right at the end. Very boring character in the first book. She might as well have not been there. She just existed to googly eyes and just be obsessed with wax. That being said, as a character, she did evolve throughout the series, and she has some great moments. There's some great character moments with Marasi. I thought, I thought at the end of the Lost Metal, I really liked the scene where the rioter is rioting her and I can't remember his name the mayor dude's shame and she's able to get up and continue to act and ignore the shame that was being pushed on her because she had developed as a person and grown past the fact that she lived under other people's shadows and she was she had shame about basically living in this the scene where Starris is introduced is simply one of the best scenes in, a th in this whole trilogy. Um, Starris is like a contract where it like specifies things that they can do, specifies how often they'll have sex, specifies um, whether or when the after they've had their first legitimate child, how many like mistresses or um, whatever they're allowed to have, like how many people they're basically about to shag, allowed to shag outside of wedlock. Because to start off with, it's it's a marriage of, uh, you know, they, they don't get married out of love, they're not getting married out of, love, out of love, they're just getting married for the value that the marriage will provide to each of their houses, so it makes sense. Um, but it's just a great scene, and right from, the, right from the first scene she's introduced, I thought she was fucking brilliant. Um, I thought it was a massive shame that in the second book she just basically gets completely sidelined. Uh, I really wanted to see more of Starris, um, <clears throat> but in the second book she just does not get that much attention, unfortunately. That all changes in Bands of Morning, um, when Starris and Wax have just this really good, this really great romance, I thought that, you know, 
Max basically realized that he did like her, and and they got together, and it was a pretty simple thing. Um, I I I really liked it. I thought it was it was really well done. Um, it was straight to the point, like. Wax and Sarah are both very straightforward people and to the point people and I thought that that really fit their characters just kind of just shacking up and getting on when they you know when Wax realized that he did like her I mean obviously Starris realized that she she fell in love with Wax before he did with her but you know I thought that that whole romance was just great um, I thought their relationship from that boy onwards was great, but I'm not really I'm not really talking about her at the moment. I'm talking about their relationship, and I'll talk about that in more detail later on. Sarah's herself, she's fucking hilarious. Um, some of the the lines that that <laughs> from Sarah's are just absolutely incredibly hilarious they, they're, they're just delivered and they're not supposed to be a joke but they're so funny um, and and some of the, th the things that she does like to be useful even though she's just a normal normal person with no powers whatsoever Steris drinking the, the um, poison and vomiting in the middle of the um, just just hacking up in the middle of the party in Bands of Morning was fucking hilarious and an incredible character. Just a great character moment. I really liked that she had guns strapped to her legs under her dress because she knew they wouldn't check there. Things like that. She's just and and when she 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 just turns up with the blicky when the when the um train ride is going on. She just she just turns up with a rifle and just tries to take a guy out, which is very brave. Um. I liked the she was kind of like she this dichotomy kind of that's implied with her character where she's like super obsessed with having everything um you know in place uh and being able to predict things um and then but also having this like element of just basically being an adrenaline junkie and just absolutely loving it whenever wax picks her up and just eats her through the city with steel pushing was fucking was a really cool detail a really cool element of a character that i really liked um i liked that uh you know she's she's just fucking adorable as well like she was she was so, she was just so fun to have around as a character um and just so charismatic as a character too uh now, obviously, the elephant in the room is that Steris is... One of the things I really like about Steris is that, I don't know for sure, at least the way that she's written, I definitely seems like she is an attempt by Brandon Sanderson at representing people who are on the spectrum. I think he did a brilliant job. Um, I, you know, she was, it, she was lovable, and it just added to her character and just made her more of an interesting character. Um, there's this trend in fiction i think to represent autism is like a bad thing um it is not a bad thing and shouldn't be presented as such and i really liked the way it's presented it she was just presented as being different but not necessarily in a bad way a lot of the time when you see autism presented it's usually like the extreme ends of autism where it's kind of you know a person that's basically they're making the the their mother's life dip like l mother's life hell or something because they have to like look after them all the time a very bleak and just not a very nice way to represent um autism this was the complete opposite of that um the, f the way she was written made her endearing and lovable and that's how in my experience people with, with autism are um a lot of the time <clears throat> you know it they people who are autistic have character traits that just that just are part of who they are and are part of the reason you love them for who they are and this was really well presented in in this as well i mean wax comes to love the way she is and love her for who she is um including the fact that she is autistic obviously they don't say that because it's set in like an equivalent to the late eight, late 19th century america where that wasn't a thing but you know <clears throat> if she was a modern day character we would not know I imagine. Now, I'm not saying for sure that, you know, that's just ha how I talk it. Um, uh, Steris is great. I, I have I have no complaints. I think she, besides Wayne, is the funniest character in these books. Just, uh, well, maybe, maybe Milan, but so fucking, so fucking funny, and she has so many great character moments. And I think it's a shame that these books weren't longer. Just to add in some 
more character moments for these characters because I really feel like two could have done with what the uh, Shadows of Self could have done with more stars. Like we could have had more stars. Her character arc as well in the uh, in the in the fourth book was great. Uh, her part to play in the story was awesome. It was really cool to see her like put to use her skills and um, her proclivities to basically fucking. I mean, she saved the day, didn't she? She saved God knows how many lives. So, yeah, just Steris is a great character, as on the character level, on <clears throat> the character writing level, and also just as a cool as a cool example of how good representation for someone with autism can be. So, Steris was great. Next, I want to talk about Milan. Now. <clears throat> She's not a main character, really. Although it's, there's no, if I remember correctly, no uh, chapters from her perspective. That being said, she be kind of becomes part of the crew in the Shadows of Self, and is extremely prominent in the Man's of Morning. And I think Milan became one of my favourite characters in these books. It was really cool to see a Kandra. Uh, to see how the Kandra changed, um, in that they they now kind of live normal lives and they're their own people, and all these kinds of things. But Milan was basically a touchstone for that part of the world building, and just as a character, it was just so fucking fun to have around. <coughs> she she has so many great character moments and her and Wayne's like fling romance type thing was really endearing and also just hilarious um, she has so many badass moments like when she pulls a gun out of her tit and when she rips her arm off and she's just got a sword in her arm things like that um, it was really cool to have just a Kandra be a main character and part of the crew and not feel like they were like fucking things up at all like the stakes or anything um overall i didn't really have that much to say apart from this uh i thought she was just really good at being there and propping up the cast and being hilarious and being there to represent the kandra um and let us peer through the world building changes regarding the Kandra through her as a character because she's really the vehicle that most of this was basically conveyed to us um, that's all I have to really say about Milan um, I do want to say she was probably one of my favorite characters in this series of books um, even though I've not said much about it, I just really just liked having her around. The She does so many small things throughout the books that just make her really endearing. And it's a shame that she's no longer around in the fourth book, really. Um, that being said, obviously the epilogue does heavily imply that she'll be turning up in other books. I don't know what the fuck is going on there, because <laughs> I've not read anything other than the Mistborn books. Um, I don't know what the significance of people having red hair is. Um, I don't know what the fuck's going on there. But I can't wait, I cannot wait for her to turn up. I'm sure she will turn up in other Cosmo books and I can't wait for her to turn up because I just fucking love Milan so much. She was, she was great. Um, just an awesome character in general and a cool callback to throw back to the original trilogy because she was in those books um you know not for long but she she did turn up a few times and speak a few times in those books and it's just i really like the kandra i just think the kandra are really cool uh, it's really cool to have a character around who's doing kandra things being a kandra um that's all i have to say about it really just really liked milan i think she deserves her own section here i liked her that much Sazed or Harmony. Now there's no chapters from his perspective and interaction with him is few and far between. But I did think that even though he's not in the books much, there's all the, the when he does turn up there's a lot of characterization going on. There's a lot implied to do with Sazed um, as Harmony. 
Um, mainly the fact that it's kind of implied that he may become Discord in the future and cease to be Harmony anymore, which would be really bad for Scadrial. Um, if he just kind of kept flip-flopping between preserving and destroying. Um, I suspect there are hard times on the horizon for the people of Scadrial because of this, but it was just really fucking cool to see Sazed around and to see him as a god and see that he's still the same, like he's still the same person, he's still doing his best to do the best, um, and this is really, do the best he can, and this is represented very well by the religion, the, the, the Pathian religion, that is based around him, which is the idea, which is based on the one core tenet, the idea that your goal in life should be to create more than you destroy, or create more good in the world than bad, and I think that's a really, I think that's quite a good philosophy to live your life by. You know, accept that you're not perfect and that you will hurt people around you because you're not perfect. But just try your best to do more good than you than you do bad. I think that's. I mean, those are words to live by. You know, so I really, um, really liked Say's um, representation as a character in this and as a god, because one of the things that I really like about the Cosmo in general is that the gods are characters in their own right. I mean. Preservation alone, we've seen Vin, Kelsia, Preservation himself, and now Sazed, all be bearers of its power. And, I mean, there was Arti as well, for, um, I think that's what it was called, for um, Ruin. And I even thought Ruin was a really cool character in um, in the original trilogy. I don't know if I mentioned that in my books, but I, in my video, but I really thought the representation of a godlike being with a mortal mind that isn't perfect and isn't omniscient and is capable of making mistakes and being dogmatic and being ruled by this intent, this desire to do certain things, was really cool. And I think that Sazed is is just more of that. He's more of this really well represented version of Godhood, fictional version of Godhood that I just think is a really cool, it's just really cool to see, and it's really well done. So, Sazed, fucking cool, his, his, how he's described as looking as a god, where he's like, him, and then behind him is just like, infinity, just stretching out with hundreds of Sazeds, and you can see into time, like, just in his shadow, it was a really fucking, is a really fucking cool idea. I don't like now I do like, I mean it's cool, but I don't like to hear that there's possibly a shadowy figure that hangs around in there and uh, maybe represents his ruin. Um, I hope Sazed finds a way to truly balance ruin and preservation, um, but I don't think he's there yet. And I think that he's going to have to go through some shit to get to the point where he can really be the guardian for humanity that Scadrill really needs. Um, Kelsey has got a point. He kind of do be doing fuck all. But I do think that's to do with the fact that he's, he again, he's scared of throwing off the balance. And it's kind of implied that if he does too much preserving, you know, he has to balance those intent, that intent to destroy and to preserve or create. He has to put. He has to balance all of it. He can't just do one more than the other. So you know, for everything that he makes better, he has to make one thing worse, maybe, um, and vice versa. For, for every one thing he makes worse, he gets to make something better. I don't know, but it's you know, it's it's definitely going to be a balancing act that would be hard for anyone to pull off. So it's just really cool to see that it's a really good way of explaining why he's not as hands-on as the other as the other shards. Um, because he can't be. He's he's in a way he's far and away more powerful than any of the other um any of the other shards. Well, I don't know that but I'm assuming that's the case. I'm assuming he's the only shard that is two as one. Um but you know, in theory he's more powerful than any of the shards who have one uh, just one shard, the power of one shard. But can he use that power? Is the question. So this was in all, all, all in all, Sazed or Harmony, whatever you want to call them, 
just just great to see him. Great to see him doing his best. Um, <laughs> great to see him and Wax's little arguments about what he should and shouldn't be doing. Great to see him and Kelsey a debate about the future of Scadrial. Um, he's not being 100% honest, which was I thought was pretty cool. Like, I, I understand that. I don't know if it would be good if Kelsey gets his Mistborn powers back. I'm not 100% sure that would be a good thing for the world, but... So, you know, I can understand telling him that there wasn't any Lorazium. Uh... <laughs> I don't know if it would be good for the world if you could mass produce, uh, mass produce Mistborn. I don't know. I think the <clears throat> it would probably. I mean, obviously, the way that the world's going, they're gonna find ways to just to just separate Alamancy entirely from people, um, or at least find a way to harvest it. I mean, the you know. The whole thing with the spikes at the end of the Lost Metal, where basically they find a way to like get a little bit of investiture into the spike from loads of different people, and then in theory, when it's fully invested, they can encode somehow the correct, um, basically change the shape of that investiture to determine what kind of spike they want it to be. A lot of potential there, but the the um, you know the the way he says the things he's doing tie into the world building and obviously he is god so you would expect that to be the case but one thing that I really don't like in fiction that much in fantasy especially is when the gods exist but they're just kind of never a good explanation for why they either don't do anything or are doing things to the things that they're doing this is a thing that I have a problem I have with a lot of Dungeons and Dragons settings I understand in Forgotten Realms it's like oh there's like an agreement between the gods that they don't do all this shit but then the evil gods just do whatever the fuck they want anyway so it just kind of doesn't make any sense but I think Brandon did a really good job with that, and says exemplifies that concept. And overall, it's great to see him. Great to see how he's doing. I want to talk about Edwan or Suit, who is uh, Wax's uncle. I, for the longest time, wasn't sure how I felt about this character, but there's something about when Wax goes to meet him in Shadows of Self where he's just he has so much charisma as a character <coughs> he's just there and he's in the thick of it and he's interesting you know I thought he was actually a pretty good villain um I don't didn't really like Telzin as a villain that much I thought it was a shame when Edwan got caught but at the same time, the epilogue scene when he got blown up and it was like, your planet, this sphere has been, you know, what was it, categorized as anathema and is going to get yeeted. Um, that was a pretty cool scene. So, on one hand, pretty cool. I like Edwan dying. On the other hand, I feel like he would have been better villain overall. Um, I think you could... It could... Brandon could have gone back, you know, if, he, if he'd planned the whole thing through, he could have had it so that Wax was close to Edwan and actually, like, looked up to him and cared about him, and that he could have the same kind of dynamic he has with Telzin with Edwan. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I thought it was kind of cool. I thought it was cool when it turns out that he's all spiked up, spiked up to the teeth and he's got loads of alamancy and... I just thought I just thought he was a really cool villain. I thought he was like a Bond villain done done well. Um, tells in I didn't think that. So yeah, I liked Edwan. Um, Ten soon, it was cool to see Ten soon again. Um, really fucking cool to see him again, even though he was a bit ineffectual. He didn't really do much. Um, Kelsia, it was really fucking cool to see Kelsia again. Uh, it was cool to see him, even if he's just a floating head, it was cool to see Kelsia. And that whole scene with Marasi at the end of the Lost Metal was really cool. Um, the ghost bloods are pretty cool. I like the um, he's making his own, like, his own faction, he's doing shit. He's like, you know what, Says, if you're gonna sit on your ass, I'm gonna go do shit. I like Kelsia, I think Kelsia is great, and I can't wait to see how he steers humanity forwards on Scadrill. I do think he's right. 
about a lot of things. I think he's probably right that Scout they need to do something on Scoutrial. They need to sort their shit out, okay? Because the amount of conflict they've got going on is not good enough. They need to they need to sort that shit sort that shit out they need maybe the world would have been better off if they let a bit of an alien invasion happen because no, there's nothing like an alien invasion that gets all of humanity together to work on the same side so you know autonomy might turn up again try and fuck shit up they need to use the time that they've basically gotten to find a way to make sure that they don't get fucking killed when autonomy turns up again so Kelsey has a point um so it's called Sea Kelsey again. Um, Marsh, uh, Marsh was really cool to see again. The few times that he turned, I, I'm not. It's not really clear what's going on with Marsh. Um, I kind of have this kind of kind of view. Kelsey, I guess he was in the south doing stuff in the south. So fair enough, he wasn't around. Um, but. With Marsh, it feels like he was around, he could have helped them out, and he didn't. Um, I'm not sure if it's a good thing that Marsh is still around. I feel like if he is still around, he should have been utilised in a way that he's like away doing stuff, like Kelsier is. Like, he's away doing something um, as an individual agent for Harmony, and that's why he's not around helping them out all the time. Because I feel like Marsh, if he'd known the things were going down the way they were and he was available to help Wax he would have done so it's only because he's ignorant and dying of old age by the lost metal that he doesn't I don't know it's, it's weird it's just not clear what he wants or why he was doing what he was doing he seemed like he wanted to help in in the lost metal but obviously he was too frail by that point but he wanted to help then why didn't he want to help earlier It was cool to see him, and it's it's just nice to have the the OGs around, say as Kelsey or Marsh, to have them around and have their legends continue. But at the same time, I don't know if I liked how it was utilised that much. It's not a big problem. I just didn't like it, um, as opposed to I was just like, he's kind of here, I guess he's here, he's a boot. Um, it was okay. I don't really think there are any other characters I want to talk about. Um, no, I think that's everything for characters. In conclusion, I thought that this series of books had a stronger, generally speaking, cast of characters. My opinion of the original trilogy is that Kelsey was great, but he dies early in. Uh, Vin and Ellen, I absolutely loved. I thought Spook was pretty good. Um... I, you know, some of the side characters, like, I liked Set, for what it was worth. I liked, um, Demu and some of the other side characters. But generally, they were pretty bland and they were just there. Apart from the main characters, which is fine. Because you should really focus on the main characters. Um, but this series, in my opinion, generally had a strong cast of characters. I liked all the characters as much as I liked Vern Elland. Pretty much, I liked Wax, Wayne, Marasi, Staris, Milan, Sazed, as much as I liked the main characters, the main cast in the um, the original trilogy, except there's just more of them here, and they're in all of the books, so I think overall I did prefer, I think I prefer the characters in these books, but it's, it's, it's not a lot between them, you know, uh... Ultimately, they are the same series of books, so comparing them is kind of pointless because these are the same series of books. You can't really disconnect them because they are part of the same story. So, um, ultimately, the Mistborn books are about the story of the world of Mistborn and uh, Scadrial and what goes on on it. Ultimately, they are all part of the same story, they're just different parts, different eras, different segments of time of the same story, so it feels kind of pointless to try and distinguish between them, but nonetheless, I did, um, I think I did prefer the characters in this books, in, in these books, just a bit, just a bit, just because I like all of them, and there's a few more of them that are really good, but that's the only reason. As usual, 
Brandon Sanderson's character work in these in these books was great. I think Brandon Sanderson's really good at writing characters. I don't necessarily think that he's the best, but I think he's really good. I think he knows how to have a strong cast of characters that you care about, and that's the most important thing. Um, not all your characters have to be super in depth. They don't all have to be extremely multifaceted. They don't have to have multiple character arts going on at once. They don't have to be super deep. And I don't think they are any of those things. They're just really fucking good characters. Um, so yeah, I just wanna. That's the main thing on the I liked section. The characters. Because the characters, as with all good stories, were the foundation, the building block that held this series up and kept me reading because they were fucking great and I wanted to know even if I didn't care about what happened story wise I wanted to know where they would go next just sticking this on the end I want to do a shout out for Moonlight and Twin Soul who turn up in the last book really fucking cool characters I don't have a fucking clue what's going on with them, Cosmo-wise. I don't know what Twin Soul, where the Aether, whatever the fuck they're called, come in. I, I, I couldn't tell you, but being able to turn into a giant rock golem mech thing was fucking sick. Twin Soul's whole, um, whole speech to the set uh, guards before he go sicko mode on them is just straight up one of the coolest scenes in uh, Mistborn so far and I thought Moonlight was a really cool character too um, and I don't know who she is I've not read anything other than Mistborn I'm sure she is from another book I imagine um, I feel like he, he missed a major opportunity to stick Cosmo characters and if that's not the case um, Moonlight was really fucking cool. I don't know what the Sheod is, I think is how you say it, or the Sheod. Um, I will find out one day when I read the book where they turn up. I will read a book one day and be like, oh shit, Moonlight's from this one. I, I don't know. Uh, it was cool as fuck anyway. Um, I guess they turn, like, when, when Moonlight like turns into a god, basically, I'm guessing that she had the option of picking up a, sh a shard or something. Um, at some point, I don't know, um, or the equivalent of, like, when Vin picked up, um, the power of the world preservation or something, I don't know, similar kind of thing. That's just an assumption, I don't know, but those stamps are really fucking cool. Um, the stuff she was able to do with that I thought was really cool. Uh, also want to shout out Aradel, um, I thought he was cool, I thought it was cool that the, he was the first non-Alamansa governor, I think it was. Um, no. He was the first non-noble governor. That was really cool. I thought Reddy was cool. Um, just as a side character, I thought it was kind of cool. Um, yeah, I think that's that's all I have to say for the for, for the characters. Finally, I will actually be done with the characters section. Uh, and next, we'll move on to talking about uh, some of the stuff that I really liked about these books. So, next thing I want to talk about is the world building because there's a lot of really cool world building stuff going on in era 2 of Mistborn. Um, so first thing is it's really cool to see the world after the events of um, I think they call it the Catasandra Kata I'm not sure how you say it because um, I think that Scadrial is supposed to be French so it's supposed to sound kind of French um, but basically when the world was renewed by Harmony and I think that the way that the world is with the basin being this really fertile area that produces loads of food and it's just generally easy to live in um, was really cool and it was really cool to see how it influenced society um, and how it's like slowed down technological progress because the people of the basin don't have to struggle to survive um, and they're able to just kind of treat each other like shit and take all the money from each other and kind of just be cons to each other and survive anyway. So, um, and there's no real need for progress. Um, it just kind of happens naturally um, and at a much slower rate because, as we know, 
necessity is the mother of invention. So, because there isn't really any necessity for technological progress, it kind of doesn't happen. Um, which was cool to see that the Southern Scadrians, the Malwish, are technologically quite advanced in a lot of ways. Um, because they have actually progressed their technology, because they have a need to do so, because they have a harsh environment that's hard to survive in. Um, I thought that was really fucking cool. Um, I thought the the melding of Alamancy um, with the early industrial... Well, not just Alamancy, but um, just the metallic arts in general with the early industrial time period was really fucking cool um you know mixing alamancy um with the alamancy with the times so stuff like um having coin shot couriers who are like just jumping through the city to deliver parcels quickly um soothers and rioters running parlors for people who want to hide from their woes and you know drown in um ambivalence or passion for pay um and little details in, in the broadsheets, things like um, there's an advertisement for looking for a slider cook for a new fast food restaurant idea, which I thought was really fucking pretty cool. Um, you know, and the mixture of technology with those things, like the fact that aluminium is a lot easier to get now. It's still expensive, but it's a lot easier to get. It is mentioned in, um, in the last book, in The Lost Metal, that soon... Um, you know, it will be it will be possible to mass produce aluminium, so it's going to tank in price. Um, so it'll be interesting to see in the era three how that affects things. But it was interesting just to see like that people wear like tin foil, like literal tin foil hats, aluminium tin like lined hats that protect them from emotional alamancy, um, and just things like having alamantic bullets that aren't able to be affected by alamancy. Um, stuff like having, you know, uh, just having an alamant, just having a aluminium gun that an alamant can't push or pull on, pretty fucking cool. Um, so that all was all really good. Um, I thought it was cool to see the terrorist people um, return to their old religion and um, kind of become. This well, not all terrorists, obviously, just a small group of terrorist people return to the old ways and try to just be peaceful <laughs> and try and chill out. Um, I thought all the stuff that happened in the verge was really cool, and I, I'm happy to see that um, even though there is an objective truth and it's written by Harmony of what happened, not everyone worships Harmony, even though he's a god. And the representation of the different religions, the Pathian religion, which Rax follows, and obviously the survivorists still going strong. Um, and the ideologies that characters of these religions have and how it affects their day-to-day -day life and how they act um, was really fucking cool. And I thought that it was a bit of a shame, actually, that um, some of the other religions, like Sliverism, uh, is mentioned, and it's just not touched upon at all. Presumably that's like a holdover from uh, the Lord Ruler because he called himself a Sliver of Infinity or something. Um, as part of his religion. Uh, presumably some of the um, obligators who survived after the original trilogy went on to kind of continue that religion. Um, presumably yeoman survived and there is a mention of a house yeoman so that could be that could be why. I think it's actually the house yeoman that are mentioned to be the sliverists so that would make sense. Um, I thought that was cool, and I think it's a shame that it's never really mentioned what they do other than worship Iron Eyes, so other than worship Marsh. Uh, I thought that was a bit of a shame. Um, but otherwise the religions were really fucking cool and it was really nice to see. Um, I thought that overall, the political conflict in the Basin and the Roughs and this kind of... There is a stratification to society and it's not the same everywhere. Uh, even though it's only been 300 years, uh, was really, really cool to see. And I thought it was generally well done. That being said, I do have some issues with it, which I'll go into in the bad section. But overall, I thought the political conflict was quite strong. Um, obviously, it wasn't the center of the story. It was more of a backdrop for pushing conflict forward. But that's all it really needs to be. 
and it felt realistic um, at the very least. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to say about the world building um, in the general sense was the expansion of the world. Uh, the the introduction of the Southern Scadrians or the Malwish Consortium um, and the fact that just the um, the people of Elendel of the Basin and the Scadrians discovering each other, not the Scadrians, sorry, the Malwish uh, discovering each other uh, has caused already massive political turmoil and changes. Um, there is a possibility that there could be war, and I expect that to be more relevant in Era 3. It would be cool if we're looking at like a cold war between the North and the South in Era 3. I think that would be really fucking cool, and I think considering nukes are a thing now, that could very much be a thing. Um, that being said, uh, Basically, it was re it was just I thought it was just really cool to expand the world um, beyond just uh, the people of Ellendale. I'm not really sure how they survived. I get that Kelsia turned up and helped them out, but I'm not really sure how they didn't die. I'm guessing Sazed saw them when he became a god and helped them out a bit, but I'm not really exactly sure how that worked. Um, I'm sure it will come up later on. Uh, but I thought it was cool because it always made sense to me that the the dominances wouldn't be the only people on the entire planet, right? Um, the um, it always made sense to me that there could have been some Scar who just like fucked off and found somewhere else to live. Um, obviously, that isn't the case. It's just that there were other peoples on Scadrio. But overall, I thought that was really cool. I think there's a lot of really cool world building changes. Um, in the general sense, because I'm just talking about the general world building in this section, I thought it was really strong. I thought the just the represent all the changes were really well implemented into the story. Um, I thought that the changes of the magic system, the changes with mixing of the magic system with the times, um, all that was just really well done. Um, so as always uh, Brandon Sanderson has done the world building really well it's one of the things he does really well um, I do think it's a bit of a shame that Scadrial is basically just Earth um, with the exception of the obviously era one with the ash mounts and everything but I do understand why it is that way it is that way because it would make it a lot easier for Brandon to have this world be an equivalent to our world um, because the whole point of this trilogy is the ten of the of these books is the technology moving forward and the times moving forward and the world changing and evolving with time um, and the events of the Cosma obviously so I think him making it closer to what Earth is like is actually going to be a positive overall because it will make things easier to understand and imagine <laughs> Um, but I am having to like explain over explain things. It's not going to be too alien and too different. Um, I think he can do that with other series, and I think he's proven that he can. He doesn't have to do that all the time. So uh, overall, the world building is unsurprisingly just really fucking good. Uh, so there you go. The world building is great in a Brandon Sanderson book. Who could have fucking guessed? Really, um, yeah. <laughs> I really liked Era 3 in general. Era 2, sorry, in general. I think the whole... Um, just... It has kind of... Um, it has like a... An air of uniqueness to it. I think that's because so few fantasy authors are willing to move out of this time period. Of a medieval or at best renaissance style kind of world. They don't want to move into a world where there's gunpowder and there's guns and there's fucking nuclear missiles like in this in the last book nukes are now a thing. The f we they avoid Elendil becoming Hiroshima. That's that's basically what happens. You you don't see that. You don't see that in fantasy. So for that alone, it's so unique and so stand out for me of all the fantasy I've read. 
it's so refreshing it's so unique and i don't think it does anything crazy like it literally just takes the western like the late 18th the late 19th on the like the late 19th century you know late 1800s kind of time that that time period in history in the real world and it just ports it into a fancy world with all of the changes like it does, it's not one to one obviously it's only it's only L and L and the basin and the roughs slightly outside the basin that that basically the world is inhabited at all but the um just just the implementation of the time period with everything else that I've mentioned is just so well done and it's just never ever mentioned I think in the general fa like fantasy space that it's such a shame that this isn't more of a common thing we need more western fantasy we need more modern day fantasy we need more stuff like that why can't you have a world that's like a modern day it would be really cool to see a generic fantasy setting like say for example lord of the rings where you've just got the generic stuff or you know you've got humans elves dwarves gnomes you know the the D and D cast of races, and it's just in it's just in a world that has the has the epic fantasy, the high fantasy as its history, and is four thousand years later, and everything's modern, and there's cities, and there's magic like mixed in with that. Think like Shadowrun, but apart from Shadow Shadowrun is our world, just with fancy shit just cropping up out of nowhere later on. Except it was always like that, and. I think that would be such a cool concept to explore, but it's just I've just never seen it done. Um, I'm, if it's out there and you watch this video, please point me towards it. Please give me some book names. I don't care. I'll read a web novel. I'll read a manga. I'll watch a TV show. I don't give. I'll play a game. I don't give a fuck. If it's that that concept done well, I'll do it. I'll, I'll I will go see it. Um, and I think Brandon deserves all the credit for this because it's fucking sick. And I just love the setting. I just think it's one of the coolest settings uh, that I've ever had the pleasure of reading in fancy. Even though, like I said, I don't even think it's that original. It's, it's generally he's just he's just taking stuff from our world and putting it in, and then he's like, "How would this interact with the magic?" And then it's just the logical extension of that, and it works. It works really fucking well. Um, I like guns. I think guns are cool. Uh, I think westerns are generally fucking shit, but they're just generally very uninspired and uninteresting. But you take a western and you put it into a fancy setting, you know, it just works. It just fucking works. You know, Star Wars works for a reason. You know, it's well the western elements of Star Wars work for a reason. It's a space west. At least it was originally a space western, and. It fucking worked, and this works too. So, there. Yeah, that's that's basically all I have to say about the world burning in the very general sense. There are more specific things I'm going to get into later on in the good section, but and some bad things I do have to say. But generally, um, yeah, great, really good. This is just a minor point. Um, but it's something that I really, really, really liked. And that was the continuation of the Era 1 legend. And by that I mean the way the the legend of what happened in, I think they call it the Anti-Verdant, which is basically before the green, uh, so to speak, before the, you know, before the plants or whatever, before the basin, um, the events of Era 1 how the characters of those books have become legendary figures in the in the modern day that people look up to and look to for basically to guide their actions and are political powers in of their own right pretty much just by having existed um you know there's it's brought up a lot like um when Marasi's talking about how she wears, you know, she wears a skirt or whatever uh, when she's policing, and she goes, you know, and you know, the Ascendant Warrior is an example to all women, and one of the reasons that you know there there isn't, well, I suppose there is still sexism in these books, um, but there's less sexism than there would have been 
uh, a lot less than there would have been um, in the equivalent time period in real life. Uh, because because of Vin, because the Ascendant Warrior, she is basically the legendary figure um, in the history of the world of um, Scadrial, and because of that, women are treated far more equally because they are because Vin was a woman. Um, her legacy continues on to the modern day to affect the very fabric of society to the point where women are treated with more respect than they would have been in our world because of Vin's very existence um, as the Ascendant Warrior. And that's just one example um, of how I thought that they continued the legend of these characters into the modern era and in an in a in and of themselves they are affecting the world building and they are being taken into account by Brandon and I thought that was really, really cool. Um, it's not a big point, but I forgot to stick it in the last section and it might as well have its own section. Um, it's great to see that the characters from the original trilogy aren't forgotten. They're still just as important. Um, in a lot of ways, they still influence the world around them long after their death, and I think it was just a really great homage to these to these beloved characters, um, really in the modern day. And it was great to see um, what, when Wayne sacrificed himself in the last book, he's kind of put on a pedestal with these characters of legend when they make a um, when they make a statue of him, and obviously the statue has a changeable hat because. Of course it has to. And um, I just thought that little detail was really great. Um, it was really cool to see Vin still get mentioned. Um, to see Ellen still get mentioned. To see all basically many of the characters be repeatedly mentioned. You know, Breeze, for example. Um, who is Wax's great-great-great-great-great-great-great-granddaddy. Um, still being mentioned. Uh, even even 300 years later uh, and could see that they haven't been forgotten um, that's all I have to say about that so I would not be able to miss this out because this is one of my favourite little things about these books um, but I have them here and these are the broadsheets um, now the broadsheets are just one of the best things about these books. So each of the books has basically a broadsheet which is basically just a newspaper um, page and they effectively they're, they're split up into quarters pretty much and they're basically split between the book between the, throughout the book um, every now and then and these are full of little world building tidbits and they're full of little um, nods to what's going to happen in the future and I really like this because I mean here you know this is you see this right at the start which is the house uh, Techiel unveils the break knot and this is in the first book and of course um, this is right at the start this is the quote you get at the start and later on towards the end of the book the van obviously the vanishers are stealing these um, trains and it's revealed that the big new train that uh, House Techiel have created to basically avoid their stuff being stolen it exists uh, way earlier in the book than before it's mentioned um, obviously there's a mention of uh, Jack here, Alamancer Jack who's kind of a bit uh, he's, he's kind of a He's a gentleman explorer that Vince is uh, not Vince, sorry, uh, Wax isn't a fan of. Um, kind of, they have a bit of a uh, a rivalry going on in the public eye, I suppose. Um, there's a lot of things here, like horseshoeless carriages are a menace, and it's talking about how um, ho uh, horseless, sorry, not horseshoeless, horseless carriages are a menace. It's talking about the motor cars, which will become more popular throughout the books just cars basically early early um mode of transport um the phantom rail car which is all about the vanishes um here we've got some general political stuff going on that's kind of uh foreshadowing stuff that happens later in the books um here this is a cool little thing mistress halex alamancer has opened a new soothing parlor so he's talking about the soothing parlors which are all about places that you would go to pay someone to soothe your emotions away which is pretty dark but also kind of cool um, 
This is a um, Elements of Jack story here with a nice little illustration. It's pretty cool. Um, here we buy metals. Some advertisements. We purchase your scrap metals at competitive rates. Purity not a problem. Briggs and Sons. And it has like the, the details here. You've got the faceless immortal iron eye sighting on the rise. So obviously people keep seeing Marsh walking around. They call him Death. Um, and all iron eyes in the modern era. Um, and there he is. There's a picture of him. Uh, here we have the face of all save my life which is a uh, reference to before the way before the um, the first Kandra even turns up in the books um, they first turn up in the second book and this is the first book so there's a lot of little nods to the future things that will be happening you pay attention to these broadsheets and it will give you in a similar way to the little um, Excerpts at the start of every single chapter in the original trilogy give you kind of they get the light to put pieces together to foresee elements of the plot. These broadsheets do the same thing, um, and I, I just really fucking love I love these things. They're so cool. There's so much awesome little world building in here, and I can't help but read these in the voice in my head of like of the um, guy from Legend of Korra who like um, who who does the uh, narration. Um, I just, I love these so much. I think they're so cool. There's one every book. Um, here you go, a political scandal of Feltry, who is, um, favoured to win the canal worker seat in the fall's elections. Uh, Rumoured to have been using allomantic abilities to create support. This is a big thing in the first, uh, in the new, in era 2. People are really worried about politicians, uh, and people in power being manipulated by emotional allomancy. Um, and whatnot. Here's some political cartoons. Um, and it's just, you know, here's an advertisement for a handgun, for a pistol. Um, from, I think that's Immeling Arms. Yeah, Immeling makes a coin shot from a common man. Patented Immeling brake frame mechanism ensures a faster, smoother reload than you need it when you need it most. Uh, that's one more reason that seasoned law keepers keep. Season lawkeeper's name Immeling is their favorite of weapon of choice. Model. I just I just love these. I think these are a very good, effective, they're a brilliant world building tool. Um, and here's a nod to the fact that electric electricity is gonna be coming in and electricity is a big deal later on. The electricity is Basically, we're breaking into electricity in Era 2 at the start. Um, and by Era... But, well, by the second book, it's kind of everywhere. Um, this is the one for the second book. This has a lot of nods to stuff that goes on. Gen this is another gentleman... Another gentleman Jack story. Um, <laughs> these Sunni pups. These are little... <laughs> this is a cool little world building thing where they're like... Sunni is Tensoon. And they make, pu they make uh, plushy dogs... <laughs> it's supposed to look like Tensoon um, to sell to kids. Uh, an advertisement for one. Here is someone moaning about coin shots, jumping through the city on lampposts and breaking them. Last 16 months I've replaced three lampposts, an iron gate and two steeple spires. All my... Uh, all at my Madian Way's house. My residence is on the sixth octant, and he's just moaning about it. More political cartoons. There you go, Ellendale beating the shit out of New Saran. Um, saying that they're treating like the rest of the basin like a child is a really nice, is a really cool thing. A play, a historical play of a hero for all ages, and it's um, a new historical opera, uh, operetta on stage now. Um, and theatre, you can see here Vin and uh, Vin and Elland. <laughs> what a cool little detail! I love that so much. Um, here, there's a, a bit of foreshadowing, well it's not really, well, it is foreshadowing because it's the first thing you see before it's mentioned in the books, but one of the main political uh, strifes in the second book is that um, basically there's a food shortage because of some floods that are going on, um, and this is foreshadowing that, tonics cure, that cure fatigue, um, Basin's favourite snack, aluminium door lobs and locks. Don't leave yourself vulnerable to allomantic ruffians. We install within weeks, so you obviously you can't use um, 
iron pulling or steel pushing to manipulate the lock, which is something that Wax does in the books. Uh, you can um, push on the pins or whatever, depending on how, obviously, depending on how you orient the lock. Um, which is quite a cool little world building tip bit. Um, but there's just so many, like, Reckless Ruffian apprehends and kills Marksman. Um, this is about Wax. Uh, that's Wax. That's a picture of Wax. So this is this... This picture, you can't see that, actually, can you? Um, this is Wax. So this is a great little... Um, a great little picture of what Wax looks like. Which I'm usually not a fan of, but I thought it was pretty cool. Um, here we go. More advertisements. Um, disturbance at Lord Winsing's in estate. Cadmium misting slows time to pulse through stodgy board meeting. <laughs> Famous baker decorates exquisite pastries with flakes of atium. Street racing threatens grand old sport. Um, people not liking new cars. And here we go. Here's a picture of what the cars look like. Which is, I think this is one of the cool little things that the, these do, is the illustrations do do a little bit of world building, and it means Brandon doesn't have to waste time describing things in, in the actual text, um, when he can just put pictures of them in. Um, which might not be for everyone, but I think it's really cool. Another Alamance of Jack story, Sinister Soiree, um, <laughs> Gentleman Jack recommends a box of cigars. Um, and here's visitors from other worlds. Um, and I didn't really get what this one was uh, implying. I'm not sure if it's a Kandra or one of the um, fucked up um, Chimera things that they fight, the hemologic constructs. Um, but anyway, maybe this is a nod to Cosmos stuff I'm not aware of. This is the new Ascendancy, which is the third books um, one, and you can see they all look different. They all have a different style in their print, which I think is really cool. Um, a lot of little effort that's gone into this. More elements of Jack um, building ships, which is a, a nice little bit of foreshadowing for the fourth book, where Bilming possibly going to war with Ellendale um, using their navy. Is very important, and obviously they attempt to deliver the nuclear, well, the nuke via boat. Um, so a little bit of foreshadowing there. Um, does Harmony have a metal? Uh, which, of course, in uh, Bands of Morning, we do find out he does. But this is right at the start, so you would see this right at the start, and it kind of puts the idea in your head, you know. Um, Farthing Mansion hit. This is a foreshadowing for uh, the attempts of the set to try and trick Wax into ignoring what's actually going on with the Bands of Mourning and going after one of his uh, one of his enemies from the past um, Sula's Choice Chewing Gum Workers unite enormous mass meetings tonight, 7th hour, at the crossing of Amble and 5th stand up to unfair taxes, low wages. Broken gondola, strands passages. Drink to the health of Ellendale. Which is a bit of sarcasm there, because they don't like Ellendale in, uh, in Saran, New Saran. Um... Looking for adventure? Basinville is looking for you. Hundreds of seas were lost at the final ascension. Magical artifacts, riches, and fame can be yours. Apply in person at Basinville's old time pub and playhouse. Do your metal tools speak to you? Hello! <laughs> your neighbor probably don't uh, your neighbors probably don't want to hear about it. But we do. Visit 27th Realm Place, ask for KRN. Bring Bring the talking metal with you. I don't I think that's a reference to is it Chris and Nazir who are from what I can understand basically people who are traveling the Cosmere and just finding shit out they're in secret history and I think that they're I'm not sure but I think that the 
Allomancy explanations in the backs of the books are written by that character. Um, I'm not sure though, because they kind of turn up in this book and they just go up to Wax and they just start talking about his powers to him and whether or not it's how um, storing iron works, how tapping iron works. Uh, which is quite a cool little thing. I don't really know, that's just a theory of mine. Like I said, I'm trying to avoid looking at the wiki. Um, potential allomancers needed to test new metal alloys. Latest scientific breakthrough has created an entirely safe method of discovering new elemental abilities. Unlock your latent potential. Um, write scientific fantasies. The playwright of A Hero for All Ages, which of course is this play down here in the second book. Um, Gassing Gondola, which is a story. This isn't Alamancer Jack, this is another person whose name I don't remember. And another political um, cartoon here. The Ravaging Lion of Ellendale, coming for the liberty, fortune, and prosperity of New Saran. So, you can see some of the politics that's going on um, in these. And the last one, the two seasons broadsheet, which I thought was really good. This one was really good. Um, it has some new stuff in it because by this point, Jesus, that is zoomed in. By this point, um, photographs exist. Uh, I don't remember what they're called, but they don't call them photographs. A vanatype, I think it's called. Um, and this is a photograph of um, the governor. Um, and basically, the vice governor, who are characters in this book. Uh, so you see what they look like. Um, this is another story going on here. Ellen Del Supremacy Bill threatens the basin unit. Do you read this right at the start? Well, quite early in, this is before um, before stuff's going on. Then you've got, um, basically before it's mentioned in the text directly, it's talking about this um, supremacy bill that's going to be uh, pushed out, that Wax is um, fighting against. Uh, beloved editor still missing. This character turns up in the book later on. So you see it's right at the start, and she has been kidnapped. Uh, and she turns up later on. Beware. Copycat claims to have uh, found the secret formula. Uh, sparkling Tonic, Vif Sparkling Tonic, which I believe is in this one. Um, I don't really remember. Maybe it's this one. Yeah, Vif Sparkling Tonic. So you see, there's a lot of interconnections between these, and they're, they're really cool, and they're really they're silly little world building things, and I love them so much. Tunnel tre uh, Tremor Stop for now, which is a uh, indication that there's going to be that the people are testing the. Um, Sorry, the set are testing bombs um, underground. More arms for Jack. Um, letter to the editor. Once again, I must object to your continued allowance of ads from the Sunni Industries uh, manufacturers of the Sunni Pup, who have ignored my numerous letters regarding their historical egregious depictions of the Ascendant Warrior's companion, a terrorist wolfhound, when scholars have repeatedly demonstrated that modern dog breeds were not yet established in the days of Ash, and that the Ascendant Warrior's guardian was not a wolfhound, but in actuality a wolf dog. Because as we know, uh, he turn uh, turns into this massive hulking dog, but... The pup is like a little tiny little cute Labrador looking boy, which is a cool little pup building that people are arguing about it. Um, enforced noseball ban. Playing the game of death himself. Noseball. These players should be going to school or working in factories. Instead, their mal aimed the balls hit unsuspecting motorists and create road debris. The mayor banned this miscreants months ago. Yet the Connors don't enforce it. Rust and ruin. Some of them even join in. Come to a rally against Noseball next Tuesday afternoon. Um, be sure to get my chin right. <laughs> Another political cartoon. Um, Larry O'Yearly. So. Some stuff going on there. Visit the Bands of Morning Temple site. Obviously from the first, from the uh, third book. Uh, these are not coins. They are dangerous, malwish talismans that must be turned into the authorities for proper disposal. Keep yourself and your loved ones safe from nefarious malwish witch, malwish witchcraft. 
16th century for a generous reward. Hmm. That's a bit of a trick, isn't it? Because they're quite valuable metal, uh, unkeyed metal mines. And someone's trying to trick people into thinking they're witchcraft to get them to sell them to them. Uh, probably for quite a profit. I love stuff like this, you know. It's just... Chocotonic, which is... Chocolate is introduced in this book because the Malwish have chocolate. Uh... Don't really get how that works, considering they're supposed to live in. I mean, it's supposed to be like ice cold there, and I don't know how they would grow chocolate, but. Flight of the Ornithor, more. This is another, um. This is another story. I can't remember her name, but she's. This, this, I'm sure this is referencing something, but I didn't understand what. Um. Nacelle. Who's this, who's this, um. She's basically like Alamance Jack, but a woman. Um, another gentleman adventurer, or gentlewoman, I suppose, in her case. Um, yeah, I just I had to mention them because I I really I really love them, and I think um, it's a shame that more authors don't do things like this. This is a twenty-minute section on <laughs> booking broadsheet on some pictures, but I can't stress enough. Uh, I wish more authors did things like this. I understand it's expensive to produce a book, and a lot of work goes into these. Um, and that's part partly why I appreciate it so much. Um, you know, it's a lot of work to put pictures and stuff and in your book, um, but it's really appreciated. And this, these broadsheets really did elevate these books for me. Uh, obviously, they're not they're not gonna be the difference between a good and a bad book, but they're they're a really cool little thing, and I'll always remember these. And they're special. I really wish the same way that the little excerpts of Star Wars chapter in the the original trilogy were, and I really appreciate these, and I just had to talk about them because I love them, and I really hope Brandon, I hope you go on to do something like this in the, in the era three um, because these are great and I love them. So, yep, that's all I have to say about the the sheets. Uh, I want to talk, uh, this is going to be a short, short section because there's really no point going into much detail about this, but the action. Um, the action is really great in these books. It's less explained on a move-to-move -move basis. So in the original trilogy, in Era 1, the fights are kind of described more like, you know, on a move-to-move -move basis between characters because they're a melee battle or an allomantic battle of powers. Whereas in these books, it's more like abstract is more um described in an abstract fashion you know wax will like fly through like just fly through a building and just plug enemies in the head left right and center and it's just described as like he takes a guy in the head he takes this guy in the chest you know and it's it's not necessarily said that it's with a gun but you know that he's just he's just flying through the edge bang 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 with two guns like a whirlwind of death flying through the building taking people out left right and center pushing bullets away from him basically being the fucking badass that he is. Um, the action in these books is very well done, I have to say. Um, and I think it's, the action in these books is actually better than in the original trilogy. And the reason for that is because the original trilogy, I think Brandon had a tendency to over explain every little thing that's being done. Like with pushing and pulling, he'd be like, oh, I push on, uh, Vin would push and pull on this and do this and that. And it's like, we get it. If you just say that Vin pulled a horseshoe around and threw it at someone, we know she's using a combination of push and pull because this is the third book and we know what how the fuck this works by now, Random. We know how it fucking works by now. But in this book, there's none of that. It's very... It's only mentioned when Wax uses Alamancy when, like, when it's relevant. Wax will just be flying through the air and you know that the reason he's flying through the air isn't because he can just fucking fly, it's because he's a, he's a coin shot and he can push himself off of objects. And obviously it is mentioned what he's pushing and off and on off, but it's not as big of a deal in this because he, it's the only ability he has other than the ability to increase or decrease his weight with his Ferrakami, which is also something that is mentioned when it's necessary to do so. And I actually thought the action in these books, it was way less verbose and was just more slick and more got to the point. And I think Brandon Sanders is actually really good at writing a firefight. Um, I think firefights are hard to write. Like, it's harder to write a firefight than it is a sword fight because you can... 
you can do there's lots of ways to write sword play like you can just do the thing the kind of thing the wheel of time thing where they explain like they're like oh here's a name of a form and its name just lets you kind of imagine how that sword play might look you know um and then there's the star wars way of doing it where it explains like sequences and all these things and you, you can kind of understand roughly how that would look um with a gun, it's kind of you put you put the gun at someone and you pull the trigger. Um, this book's really good at describing the difference between when Wax like shoulders a gun and like leans into the shot for a for a shot, versus when he's just like kind of just popping shots off with his handguns all over the place. It's more of like an instinctive. I'm a sick shot because Wax is a sick shot with a gun. I mean, no, it wasn't always. So it's cool to. It's just it's just really well written the way he's just like described us as just like this monster who just walks through buildings and just kills hundreds of people um the action's great in these books okay and it's not just when it's wax fighting the action's great when it's anyone fighting even when it's Marasi just taking some pot shots from behind cover when it's wayne running up into a fight wayne the way the action's written with wayne's injuries and the way he like experiences injury differently to a normal person because he's so used to it and because he's a blood maker is really good um i also like the way that they use speed bubbles in combat just to plan like they'll be fighting and then then wax will be like wait and then he'll make a speed bubble and then they'll be like okay right we've got to discuss this because we're surrounded now so you know we're gonna come up with a strat and then we're gonna explode out the speed bubble at the last moment and take everyone by surprise and get out of this basically the situation we're in and it's just fucking awesome there's so many cool action scenes that aren't combat scenes in this books as well there's some really standout ones for me um standout examples of action in these books um are so say for example miles blowing himself up to escape being captured wax rushing through the vanishers base in the first book to save staris and the way that he basically just he, he pushes himself in the air increases his weight by like 100 times like uses all of his weight in his metal mind and then he pushes on every single piece of metal in the building so in this building so he just basically every nail every doorknob every window every like every piece of metal he can find in the building he just pushes it downwards and the building just collapses and the, the mixture of his um if, if it, i'll talk about this in the magic section but if him using his, his powers in tandem is, is very good you know there's that there's things like a wax chasing the criminal at the start uh, through ellendale the marasi versus the soothers this was a really cool scene in the second book where there's a bunch of soothers and right uh, soother and a rioter i believe who are basically manipulating the emotions of a crowd in order to cause a riot and uh, they basically, it's just like 10 police officers versus 10 set. Um, and they just they just have a scuffle. And uh, Marasi basically, they can't use guns because they don't want to draw the crowd over. Um, because the crowd are being kind of anti-government at the moment. And they're cops and they don't want the crowd to beat them up. So, uh, And then Marasi sneaks in and into this carriage with these soothers and points a gun at them and she has one of the best quotes in the whole book which is I have a theory that a gentlewoman should never need to resort to something so barbarous as violence to achieve her goals wouldn't you agree? and then they just like nod because they have a gun pointed at them and she goes yes indeed a true gentlewoman uses the threat of violence instead so much more civilised <laughs> there's so many good quotes in this but I'm not going to say a quote but fucking great quotes in these books um very quotable these books so was the original trilogy I have a lot of lines that just hit hard like i said one of the things i like about brandon sanson is i think his prose is very basic and very simple but he knows how to ramp it up into being more purple when it needs to be more flowery when it needs to be only when it needs to be for emotional impact and it's that contrast between the two that makes it work so well for me some other examples of action that i would consider to be action even though they're not necessarily fighting or anything like that um wayne's romp through ellendale in bands of mourning when he's just going through ellendale and he's going from place to place and he's just tricking people into doing shit and he's just stealing things and switching things and then he eventually gets to renette and he gives her a gift and he tells her that he's over her and he's going to move on with his life. Very heartfelt scene, and the action is is the. I mean, it is action, isn't it? It's thriller action type thing. Um, it was great. It was it was a great scene. Um, not necessarily a fight, but it was it was a great scene. The night street. Uh, I think they were called the night street attack on the train. Was a 
awesome action scene, I thought. One of the best in the whole series. They, they attack the train that Wax and that lot are in, and their train ends up, their car gets decoupled from the rest of the, uh, from the train, and then they, they get attacked on that. And Wax does one of the coolest things in the whole series, where he jumps behind the train, and he increases his weight, and then he pushes the train. And he keeps, basically pushes the train, and then he pushes off the, um, off the tracks to keep up with the train and then he pushes the train further until eventually it catches up with the main body of the train and just attaches back onto it. That was so fucking cool. And that's not combat, but it was sick action. Milan ripping her arm off and having a fucking sword in there, an aluminium sword, metal as fuck. Darius and Wax's um, flight over New Saran, the battle by the airship in Bands of Mourning, very fucking hype. Wax versus Edwan, um, and Wax's rampage with the bands. Fucking awesome action. Wax arriving at Bilming in The Lost Metal was an awesome action scene. He just turns up and saves the day. It was a Deus Ex Machina, but it was a good one. Marsh turning up to save them from prison. Him taking the gun and pulling and pushing it and in between his hands and crushing the gun was a really fucking cool display of alamantic power. Marasi, Moonlight, and Twin Soul infiltrating the base. Twin Soul turning into a giant mecha made out of stone, like crystal stone. I don't know what the fuck's going on with that guy, but that was fucking cool. Also, Twin Soul's like, uh, what's the word? Like his, um, his speech to the set members before he kills them. He's like, gives them a chance to leave and then they start shooting at him and he's like, okay, well, cowabunga it is. Was really fucking cool. And then obviously the, I think the, the two, I think the two iconic action scenes for me throughout this whole series were Wax and Wayne versus not Wax and not Wayne. And way, uh, fucking Wax, his blaze of glory through the shore was fucking awesome. The action in these books is great, whether it's fighting or not fighting. Better than, the, I think better than the original trilogy. The original trilogy had some fucking awesome combat, awesome fight scenes uh, going on, generally, but at the same time, I think this, this trumps it. I think this trumps it, and the reason it trumps it is because I just think that the way the powers work in this are more interesting, because they're more limited. So, there, that that's, that's all I have to say about the action. Again, probably not a surprise, Brandon Sanderson's quite well known for doing action well, for having these cool set piece moments where characters do cool things like wax pushing the train. To me that is just so that is one of the coolest scenes in Mistborn so far. Um yeah. Unsurprisingly, the action is great. Next I want to talk about the evolution of the magic system throughout these books. Um the magic system changes very significantly. Um in, fundamentally, it's the same, but the reality is um, that it has evolved. Uh, and so there's a lot of things going on. So some of the things I thought were really cool were the unkeyed metal mines, which has some really cool possibilities for the future. Um, the possibility of creating hemologic spikes without killing someone. So the idea that you can basically take a little bit of um, someone's soul or their investiture um, and then encode the power that's in that spike into a different, in the investiture in it, into a different um, alimantic or ferrochemical power. Now, I don't know how this would work, because the power that you can take with, hem with a hemologic spike is tied to the metal that the power is made of, but if the spike was atium, uh, I could see that working, because atium can steal any power. So, there's that. Um... The other thing that I like is the mixture of the metallic arts and technology, um, which is shown with the Malwish and their unkeyed metal mines, the bands of mourning, um, being unkeyed, um, just generally cool as fuck, and there's a lot of really interesting applications for this. Um, I don't really have much to say on this, because I want to talk about this in more detail. Um, when I'm talking about Setup for Era 3, which is one of the things that I really like about these books. So, that's that. I think that this is very, very short section. I just think that these very seemingly small, but extremely significant um, changes, I cannot wait to see how they affect the future of the books. Um, another thing is also the introduction of the ability to split harmonium into lorazium and atium. Now, how long that will remain a secret, I do not know. If 
I it's going to be crazy if Lorazium ever becomes something that can be produced because if you can produce Mistborn, that's pretty whack. Um, that's pretty crazy. So anyone who has the ability to do that is going to become very powerful very quickly. So. And, and and many people have the ability to do that. Of course, it does require Trallium. So there is that. But there is quite a bit of Trallium lying about. I mean, there's a Trallium spike in a lot of the set members. Um, God knows how much there is out there. So they must have had a, a stockpile of it somewhere. So just generally really interesting stuff. Going over the magic system. Um... I think the Unkeyed Battle Mines is especially the most interesting thing that's been mentioned so far uh, in terms of the expansion of the magic system. It has so many applica possible applications. Um, but like I said, I'll go into that in more detail for things that I'm thinking about later on. But yeah, the, the, the magic system is expanded. It's also kind of atrophied in a way because obviously you've not got fairings and... You, you, so you've got fairings now. Um, I don't really understand how that works. I'll go into that into the bad section, but the um, I think overall it's a good change, uh, making Ferrakemi be like Alamancy in that it's fragmented, and you get fairings like you get mistings, and then a Ferrakemist is a full Ferrakemist, and then a Mistborn is a full Alamancer. Um, I think that's cool. I'm just not sure how it works from an investiture standpoint probably based on my limited understanding of how investiture and magic systems generally work in the Cosmo because I've only read Mistborn so yeah the evolution of the magic system is evolving and it's changing and that was one of the things I really liked about the original trilogy is that they continuously added new powers and new ways that the Alamancy worked that people didn't know before, you know, the introduction of Dura Lumen and things like that. Um, the slow reveal of Hemology is a thing that exists. Um, in general, fucking awesome. Uh, really done well. This is, shouldn't be that much of a surprise. Again, Magic Systems is Brandon's thing, besides action. Um, well, it's his main thing, really, isn't it? Action and, and world building, unique settings are his kind of thing. So, not that surprising, I suppose, that I liked this, but nonetheless, I thought it was brilliant, and I think it's one of those things that Brandon is continuing to blow me away with uh, in every single series of books that I've read of his. Hopefully, that will continue in his other books. Next point I think I really liked about the books is a bit of a weird one. Because <laughs> it's a bit ironic. Uh, the lack of Mistborn and Mistborn. I really like this. Um, I like the... Taking the Mistborn out of Mistborn... Um, was a brilliant choice. Because for a start... First thing. The first reason. Is because... It really makes... The original trilogy stand out. As this like height of power for Alamancy. Um, from a natural inborn power standpoint. Uh, it's a, obviously a common theme in fantasy that power, like magic wanes over time, and so does understanding of it typically wane, and so do, does um, the general power of magic wane over time, and it's instead replaced with technology. And this is what he's doing in these books as well. The the amount of destruction that humanity are capable of with et metal alone far exceeds what any. Alamancer, regardless of power, has ever been capable of, um, with the exception of Vin, when she uh, when she was fully absorbing power preservation, I suppose. But generally, it's this kind of the natural inborn power of magic going down, but then the innovation of humanity increasing that um, that power over that that capability for force. Um, and violence over time uh, that I think is being done really well in these books and Miss the Mistborn had to be removed from the series for that to work um, and it really allowed the individual alimantic and ferrochemical powers to shine um, increasing and decreasing your weight seems kind of useless except when you mix it with being able to push 
being a being a coin shot, obviously the main mechanism of being a coin shot being if you push on something heavier than you, it pushes you up. If you push on something lighter than you, it pushes it away from you. Um, if you can therefore affect that variable of your weight um, relative to what you're pushing on, you're capable of incredible feats of power, as Wax is in these books. For example, pushing a fucking train by increasing his weight. Um, kind of whack, gotta say. Whack, but fucking sick. Also, really fucking cool in general. So, um, I thought the, you know, just in general, removing Mistborn was really, removing the Mistborn and all people having all the powers was really cool. Um, and I'm looking forward to see how that continues into the future and it also makes hemology way more tempting and way more interesting because it didn't seem that useful in Mistborn except for giving Mistborn except for ruin manipulating people by having a spike in them and giving Mistborn Ferric Emmy uh, to increase their power even further um, seems a bit limited uh, in the original trilogy and now it's far, like, it's far more understandable that someone would be tempted to spike themselves to gain power. Um, so in a way it's just made all the other magic systems stronger and more interesting. Um, Alamancy is still awesome, it's still great, even though you know, even though it, there's less of it in a way. So yeah, the lack of Mistborn ironically is uh, something that I thought was a real strength of these books. So the next thing I want to talk about is the implementation of firearms and modern technology, um, which I think is Mistborn Manifest. Um, I think this was this is the reason uh, I wanted to read these books in the first place. I was aware that this was the primary concept of these books, that they would move through different time periods and the magic system and the world would evolve and change with it. Uh, and I think... Brandon's fucking. I think I've mentioned. I've already mentioned this, but Brandon's fucking nailed this with these books. Um, I cannot wait to see the future of Mistborn and where it goes. Um, I just think it's the coolest fucking idea ever. Um, there's no other way to put it. I mean, I just think the way that the technology and the and the magic work together in tandem to push the series forwards is just incredible and I've never seen anything like this done so well um, the thing is that then there is also the technology and how technology and the and the magic system bounce off each other um, for example um, the biggest best example of this I think is Renette um, and the guns she makes for wax um, so you know for example We've got um, Vindication, which is a revolver. Um, originally, it was made of steel, if I remember correctly. Um, but basically, it's just a badass gun. But it has eight chambers. And there are two chambers where Wax can put in haze color rounds. Um, and he can switch between the haze color rounds and normal rounds. Um, and it has an alamance, it has like a safety inside the actual mechanism of the gun that can only be turned on and off by pushing it. So Wax can turn the safety on and off of his gun without having to like flick a safety, he can just do it with alamancy, um, which is really cool. And that, that's, that's that kind of mixture of technology and alamancy that I really like. Um, it can never be turned on, it, it can never be turned on. Uh, or off by someone else, only only him in theory. Um, but obviously, unless it's a fucking lurcher or a coin shot, they could in theory do that. But they would have to know that the safety's in there. So um, there's a couple of other things like a like a shotgun that has a shit ton of power, like shit ton of stopping power. And the only reason Wax is able to use it is because he increases his weight to fire it. Um, it's basically designed to fucking um, it's designed so that only he can use it because anyone else who tried to use it would inevitably be injured or knocked over if they tried to shoot it but also it has just insane stopping power which would allow him to take on a opponent who's hard to kill because of alamancy 
Um, another thing that I really liked was the haste killer rounds, which are a repeated thing. Um, there's obviously the coin shot rounds, which have ceramic tips, and the way they work is if the the rest, basically there's a ceramic tip on the end of the actual round that gets fired, and when uh, a coin shot pushes on the round to try and stop it from hitting them, the rest of that metal shell will break away. The rest of the metal, sorry, the metal slug will break away, and then you'll just be left with a small ceramic round that will still hit um, the coin shot. Now. It's it's not going to have high amounts of stopping power because it's a little tiny ceramic bullet, but it's still going to hit them, which is kind of fucking sick. Um, also, there's some lurch arounds with uh, ceramic sides that explode when pulled on, um, which creates shrapnel. Um, and this is important because lurchers, one of the ways they deal with bullets is they wear like armor on their chest, like metal plates, and they pull the bullets into the metal, because it's better to get hit in the metal than it is to get hit on your fleshy bits. Um, but this kind of this kind of negates that, because they're just going to pull the bullet towards them, and then it's just going to explode into shrapnel, and it's just going to hit them anyway. Um, and again, it's probably not going to kill them, because it's loads of little tiny bits of shrapnel. But, well, it could, actually, to be fair, because shrapnel is quite dangerous, but... Um, it, it's it's less. It's gonna be more harmful than it is gonna gonna just straight up kill you, basically. Um, then there's the tin eye tin, tin eye rounds, which make a really loud sound when fired, um, and a really loud sound when they hit something. Um, and this is to basically fuck with tin eyes. Um, <laughs> just make just make their day hell. Um, pure pewter arm rounds, which are really big bullets, basically, that have way more gunpowder. And the idea is that the increased stopping power will overpower the resilience of a pewter arm for getting shot. Because pewter arms can be shot. Um, obviously, they're not invincible. They'll still go down. But their pewter will keep them going for a while after you shoot them. Um, so the increased stopping power is supposed to stop them, ideally. And the coolest of all them, which is the hemologic bullet... Which Vin, uh, which Vin Wax uses to take down Bleeder at the end of the second book. It's his own earring that gets for his own hemologic earring that gets reforged into um, basically into a bullet, and then he shoots her with it. And because she now has too many spikes, Harmony is able to take over her. And that's how they defeat her, and also how she dies. Um, the other thing, the other two things that I thought were cool were um, the fact that he gets just another vindication, um, and this one uh, ha is basically aluminium, and it can't. Uh, well, it's aluminium, so the obvious effects are that it can't be pulled or pushed on. Um, but also that it has two more chambers. Now I'm not sure it is mentioned as two extra chambers. It is not mentioned whether these are extra chambers on top of the extra chambers of the previous model. So the previous model, at least I don't think it is, the previous model had six chambers for regular rounds, then it has two chambers for haze killer rounds. I'm not sure if this one then has two more to make it ten chambers in total um, for these hemology rounds which are basically haze color rounds that just explode they're, they're just explosive rounds and when they hit someone they explode and the idea is they'll go into the wound and explode and that will cut like basically if you shoot where the hemologic spike is it'll explode causing the hemologic spike to be basically ejected from the body because the wound is going to be a big gaping wound the main use for this is to try and take on people who have healing, because a lot of the fucking set just have heal. Just have, they just are gold fer uh, fairings because they have um, the spikes for it. Really fucking annoying. Um, and Wax obviously takes out Not Wayne by shooting Not Wayne in the in the shoulder, and then it explodes, causing their entire arm to come off, and their spike was in their arm, um, rendering them unable to heal. Um, <laughs> He gets the Steel Survivor, which is kind of bland. It's just a aluminium pistol that has a very long barrel for precision. And the coolest gun I thought they got was the big gun. As of yet unnamed, it is simply the big gun. Um, 
and it's basically just one of those grenade launchers that you, that they have um, in the modern day that's kind of like a giant revolver. <laughs> that's how I imagined it. Um, and it shoots slugs larger than shot glasses, so big old slugs with loads of pellets um, that then wax can push on to create just walls of death, basically. Um, and Wax uses this in his, like, blaze of glory at the end of uh, the Lost Metal when he fights up the um, the shore, I think it was called, um, to get to his sister to stop the nuke. Um, this is just an example of one example of the technology and the um, and Alamancy mixing together. And I, I really think it's just, I really think it's really cool. Um, obviously the other example, the main example I can think of is the use of aluminium to protect one from, uh, from emotional allomancy by just wearing fucking aluminium in your hat. Wearing a tinfoil hat because you're paranoid about, uh, mind control. Which is just hilarious, the, that's, that's the thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, that's all I have to say about this. I just think the implementation of the firearms, modern technology... Um, the the progress of technology was really cool. So, they uh, electricity becomes more common um, until eventually it's just basically fully implemented into society. Radios are now a thing. Uh, ships are now a thing. Like warships, like World War Two style navy ships, really fucking cool. Um, I'm really looking forward to where this goes. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to where this goes. I cannot wait for the um I'll go, we'll, you know we'll, we'll talk about this in the next section but I just I just think this was great and it was really well done and as a focus point of the point of these books Brandon Sanderson's nailed it on the head he's done a really fucking good job um and he deserves so much credit for that because it's just really good world building and it's really cool to see and really interesting and the way that these do mix into the fights and the combat and they they elevate the stakes like a gunfight is kind of hard to get to feel like it has stakes but when you make it so it's all about getting like one of your two bullets in the enemy in the right place to win the fight that makes that fight feel tense like it has stakes and the mixture of these te these technological devices with the weapons that, that um, Wax has to deal with foes just really elevates the action um, and makes it, it creates stakes, uh, ironically, even though it makes him more powerful because he wouldn't be able to deal with a lot of the Alamancers he fights without this technology, without this technology, basically. So, yeah. The technology, really fucking good really good. So the last thing I want to talk about is setup for Era 3. I am fucking hype for Era 3. Um, I can see so many cool applications of unkeyed metal mines um, mixing with modern technology and computing. Um, I think turning Ferrochemy into more of an economic magic system by having people be able to buy ferrochemical power will be really fucking cool. Um, I can't wait to see how the et metal technology goes on because obviously they have the et metal grenades, they call them, but they're basically small et metal devices and you can basically charge them with halomancy and throw them and they will remotely activate the halomantic power. Now, that has so many fucking cool applications from modern day setting. Um, what if you charge a bullet with Nicrosil and then you fire it? Like, what if you can make a bullet that works like these metal grenades and you th and you shoot someone with a Nicrosil bullet that gets rid of all their metals? Or um, you could, you know, you could it could even be like a taser or something that you just like take like like a something on the end of a string and you just throw it at them, or or, or even a bow like a crossbow that could just like fire a Nicrosil. Of, like spike into someone and then effect and that's just nicrosil so like there's loads of there's loads of um 
really cool applications I can think of. Uh, what if you shoot someone with a bullet that's got that's charged with cadmium? Cadmium, um, cadmium. Like if you shoot someone with a bullet that's charged with cadmium, right? The bullet goes into them and immediately. A speedball springs up around them. They're gonna be rarely fucking injured by the time they get out of that speed bubble. They might not even be able to get out of the speed bubble, depending on where you shoot them. So it's just a death sentence. Like, that's a death sentence, basically. If you shoot someone with a bullet that's that's just traps them in time. That's crazy. So, that has some really cool applications. Um, another one I've thought of is the possibility of maybe being able to like a med maybe a medical application of harmonium so maybe the ability to maybe put harmonium into a solution of some description to basically um basically like charge it so you could possibly have like a, a syringe of harmonium charged with pewter and then you could inject it into someone's body and that would release the harmonium into their body, release the investiture into their body and then um, basically give them the power of pewter to make them better able to survive their injuries um, for a time. Or you, it could be used as a stim to give yourself strength, like temporarily, or... Um, you know, just generally playing with all these powers, like you could get, like, have a coin shot stim, like, like, uh, you could give yourself, um, an allomantic power by injecting it into yourself. That would be fucking cool. Um, what happens if you inject, um, I don't know, uh, if you inject the ability to, or you inject a soothing into someone, or you inject a ri rioting into someone? There's so there's so many cool applications for that. I just think that I just think this these this et metal te grenade technology. I think this is so. I think this has flown under the radar for a lot of people from what I've seen online. There's so many cool applications for this in the future. We don't know what harmonium does. One of my problems with these books. I'll go into later, but exactly what it does anyway. It clearly absorbs investiture in some way and does something with it, but um. Yeah, I just, I just think that the I cannot, cannot wait for Era Three. Um, I cannot wait. So I've got here some stuff that's been said about Era Three. Now I'm not worried about looking at the stuff because it's not happened yet. It's a book that's not out, so I'm, I'm gonna have a look. But um, I've not read the Stormlight Archive yet, so you know, there's that. Um, but just this, this whole thing of um, it, Ghost Bloods is shooting. Um, with the implication being that the Ghost Bloods are going to be the primary group of uh, the characters are going to be members of the Ghost Bloods, uh, the main characters in these books. That's really fucking cool. I think that's really cool. Um, and the thir uh, third trilogy set in, a, in the early computer age with 1980s technology. That is so cool. The main character is planned to be a terrorist woman who is a computer programmer and a microburst, um, which I think is really cool. Um, Nerd culture works on Scadrial. That's cool. This should plan for a, treacher, uh, a trilogy to feature Alamance's SWAT team with a member of Alamance's side to take out serial killer, but now leaning towards a spy thriller. That's cool. Um, after Stormlight 5 and so Stormlight 5 is coming out soon, I believe. I keep seeing trailers. I've not watched them because they're definitely going to spoil us in, but I keep seeing trailers um, pop up um, on YouTube. And it's going to be more similar to the right, the, the third, the first trilogy, writing all books before publishing. Um, returning to the length of the Mistborn one book, era one books, which will be really good because I actually thought these books, although, funnily enough, I one of the reasons I thought I would prefer them is because they'd be shorter. They're shorter, and more digestible, but I actually just don't think that works for Brandon Sanson. I don't think he's very good at that. I think he's way better at having a full-length novel to fully flesh out all of his ideas and concepts and represent whatever he's got in his head and just get out into the world, you know, onto the page. And I feel like he was really holding himself back with these books, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but I think he, he could have explored concepts more thoroughly. Um... So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, they're 
include a global map of Scandrial. <laughs> Fuck yeah, I love maps. Um, short comics that are planned to be interspersed with them, similar to the Broadsheet Snare 2. In the comics in the book. Oh. Oh, that's so fucking cool. <laughs> that's going to be sick. If that actually does happen, that I'm going to be so pleased. I love the broadsheets, and I think that putting little comics in them would be an elevation of that concept. Like, that would be so cool. Um, Jesus. Alamancy involved sports? Well, we know that's a thing because fucking Wayne accidentally creates um, basically the football league or whatever with Alamancy just on a whim. Um, various characters are planned to be twinborn with really neat combinations. To be fair, the twinborn stuff is really cool. Planned to play, take place 50 to 70 years after Era 2. Southern Scadrians will be well known to the rest of Scadrial. Put more focus upon Kelsia and Trell. And Milan is also expected to play a role. Fuck yes. Possible Cyberpunk Mistborn trilogy? Between Ares 3 and 4, oh, I would fucking come. Oh, I love cyberpunk so much. So I love sci-fi sci and sci cybernetics are just so cool. I just... Please, please, Brandon, please do this. I, Even if it's just like three novellas, please do this. Please do this. Similar in length to Ares 2. That's fine. That's fine. Written around the time is the second half of the Storm Archives. So I'm guessing the second half of the Storm Archives will be quite a bit after the current Storm Archives books. That's interesting, because that means he will be doing a... It looks like he'll be doing a similar thing with Storm Archives, but just once. Because obviously Miss will have three errors, and this will uh, just be the one just with Storm Archives, which will be two errors, I guess. But yeah, that, that's, that's really cool. That, that makes me more hype to read uh, the Storm Archive now. Because, um, like like I said, this is the thing that I really like about these books. This trilogy will become Era 4 and push Space Age Mistborn to Era 5. Put Mistborn up to a fitting 16 books, baby. Holy shit. If a whole trilogy isn't feasible, he wants to at least write a novella. Please, that would be so cool. Plot known to Brandon wants to play with unseated metal mines as cyberpunk esque metallur metallurgic wetware. Shit, that sounds fucking cool. Fourth trilogy is going to be a space opera. This is what I'm most looking forward to. I love sci fi. Space opera sci fi. I still have to read Sun Eater. Um. Which I will. It's on my list. Oh, I fucking can't wait for this. I could, this is... God damn. Hoyt's going to be a main character. That motherfucker. I don't know who he is, but he'd be everywhere. I don't think... All, I don't know if I've mentioned this earlier, because I've made this video for four days. But I think that um, Hoyd... All the Hoyds aren't Hoyd. I suspect... Because it just some of them just don't make sense to me to be Hoyd, you know. Like also, they're just conveniently not always described. Like the Hoyd who 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 dro who is um, Wax's driver is a ghost blood, but I doubt Hoyd's a ghost blood because Kelsia met Hoyd when he was in the uh, cognitive realm in a secret history. So it must just be another guy with the same name, right? And also he's not described. Whereas, like, we know Hoyd has white hair, I think. So, I don't know. Anyway, that, that, Hoyd's a very interesting character. Um, like, as a thing to put in the books. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing if he turns up in, uh, in the Storm Archives. I'm assuming he will. The Sleepless or Dissian... Amians? Don't know who they are. We'll have a major role in this trilogy. 
they are Ira Ali. I also plan to have a major role. Don't know who they are. Two. Uh, this may be two more currently untitled Cosmos series written before this. There may be two more currently untitled Cosmos series written before this trilogy. He plans for each Era 4 book to be around the length of a Stormlight Archive book. Shit. How long are Stormlight Archive books? Stormlight Archive book length. Fuck me. I mean, I've got the first one. I know it's a thousand pages long. But like... Uh, words. Um. Okay, so, so they're pretty long. <laughs> oh, the hardcovers are shorter. Right, fair enough. Um, yeah. That's whack. 1,328 1, fucking pages, dude. That's double the length of a fucking... Mistborn book. Of the original trilogy. I'm in for some fucking shit. Jesus, I'm in for it, aren't I? Anyway. I didn't read anything other than the page numbers. The page next there. I'm avoiding spoilers. Um, but yeah, so... Just want to say... Um, You just saw what I'm listening to there, didn't you? Whatever. Um, I I am so looking forward to the future of Mistborn. Um, you know, I fucking love sci-fi. Space, specifically space operas. I'm a big Star Wars fan. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to what goes on. Um, with the sci -fi, with the sci-fi stuff later on, a cyberpunk trilogy sounds fucking awesome. Please do it, and I cannot wait for this like 1980s, I imagine Cold War style kind of era thing that's going to be going on with the new one with the with the um, era three. So yeah, this kind of became its own thing, didn't it? Um, it was supposed to be about this tri this this section was supposed to be about setup for Era Three. I've just kind of talked about like how hyped I am in general for the future of Mistborn. Basically, um, I am really, really, really looking forward to the future of Mistborn. I cannot wait to see where these books go. Um, yeah, they're just so unique, um, and I just really, really, really want to see what happens. Uh, I think that's basically everything I have to say about how excited I am for the future of Mistborn, which is very. So, the last thing I want to say for the good section, because I've had a lot to say in the good section, because this video is about the all four of those books and how great I think they are, so it kind of had to be longer. I didn't really want to make a video per book, so here we are. Um, I, I really, just in conclusion, want to say for this section, there's so much to love about these books. I've seen people say some really bad things about these books. I understand them not necessarily be, they're definitely not perfect. Um, and you have to understand these weren't originally even supposed to be part of the original plan of the Mistborn setting. So Brandon's really just spawned an entire era out of his arse. Based on like just a just on just on three characters he really liked, and that's that's really impressive. Um, not many authors can take three characters they like from a novella and turn it into a really really good series of books, um, while also building upon a previously beloved series and just keeping it good. It's hard to do that. Sequels are very rarely better than the original. Um, I think I prefer this overall. I do think that in many ways, Era 1 was better. Um, but that being said, these books are just, they're just, I just think they're 
incredible. <laughs> and I think I'm I'm clearly extremely biased, obviously, because I just think I just love the I just dig the concept of these books so much of the idea of moving through time periods. I just think it's the coolest shit ever. So obviously I'm extremely biased and that's probably affecting my enjoyment of the books a lot. Just I like to see that. But yeah. I loved so much about these books. And I cannot wait to see what happens next. Next, I will go on to the things I didn't like so much about these books. But there's not as much of that. Not as much to talk about. Not not nearly as much. So, we're getting to the end now. We're getting to the end. So, the bad section. I've not got much to say here. I've only got three major points. Um, and all of them are pretty... Not that big of a deal, really. Um, that much. Because ultimately they're mollified by other things that I liked about these books. But the first one is the lack of exploration of ideas that are presented. I don't think they're properly explored um, after they're presented. So the first one of these is the Coloss being able to have children and be normal humans kind of but have blue skin but it's not really explained how that works. They just can. The assumption is that all of the Coloss were changed by Sazed, but does that mean they're no longer hemologic constructs? They're just like that? Or does it mean they're still hemologic constructs, but they can just have kids? I don't know how the fuck it works. I'm just confused. Um, it might be explained outside of the books, but to be honest, I hate that. I think that's um, just shit. I hate when authors do that and they're like, ah, oh, fine, I'll explain this outside of the book. It's like, no, if it's not in the book, it might as well not be canon. So, there's that. Um, the roughs in its entirety. I think the roughs are a cool concept. They exist outside of L&L, obviously. Um, I think they're just so fucking underutilized. The roughs are mentioned to exist. Presumably, it's like a western where like they're just kind of dusty old buildings and everything's shit. Presumably. I just think it's so fucking underutilized and it's just a shame because... I think the roughs conceptually is really cool. They, they never go there. Uh, Wax used to be there. There's a couple of flashbacks in the roughs. But it's never really described or explained explicitly. Or we never see it. We know that there's a bunch of Coloss out there. And there's like Coloss Barbarian tribes and shit like that. And it's just kind of like... I mean, the Coloss being able to have children is a bit of a world building problem for me in general because if Coloss can have kids, humanity's fucked. Like, it's over, fam. Because the Coloss can survive on anything, right? They can, they can, they don't need food. They just. Ah, actually, now I think about it, it's probably not the case because. Well, it depends. Because if they can just become a Coloss. Like, if they're just born a Coloss, and they just can be a Coloss, and they have all the benefits of being a Coloss, like, they can just eat dirt and survive, um, and then reproduce that way, like, normally, then, then humanity is fucked, because they're just going to reproduce, and they, they can just eat anything. So they can just overwhelm humanity easily, at least could. But I suppose there would be factors stopping that, like the fact that they're not just going to sit there and do nothing, they'll probably kill each other and stuff like that, I suppose. Um, then there's also, but then, then again, then again, I guess if they're like, they have to be spiked hemologically, then they're limited by the amount of them that exist are limited by the number of spikes that are out there. So I guess there is that, to be fair. Um, anyway, the roughs, yeah, it's, it's a bit, it's just a bit, it's just one of those like far out ideas, like in the setting. And I just don't, don't think it's very well utilized. In my opinion. Um, which I think is a shame. But I understand why it is the way it is. Not a big deal. But I think it would be cool if we got some short stories. Set in the roughs. I, they, may, they might exist. Um, in which case. This uh, this criticism is a non-criticism. 
Um, and I'm talking up my arse. But, you know, I'm not aware of any. The other main thing um, is Ferrochemy becoming fragmented and the existence of fairings. This has some world building implications that I don't understand. Um, so, Alamancy's origins will Erasium. And Lorazium turns you into a Mistborn. If you say you're a full Mistborn, then you had all the powers. If you had a kid, there's a chance they could be a Mistborn or a Misting, presumably. But the way that Alamancy work, that Farrakemi works here, implies that because Farrakemi is diluted in the blood, because there's so few Farrakemists, like direct Farrakemists left, the same way that if you know, the same way that there are any Mistings now. <laughs> Um, it means that there's only pharynx now. Okay, that makes sense. Kind of. But, that has implications for Alamancy. Originally, with the, the original Mistborn, were all their kids Mistborn? And did it did it just dilute over time and eventually get to the point when when was the first Misting born? Originally, all Pharachemists had all the powers, right? So does that mean that originally all Alamancers had Mistborn powers, all the powers, and eventually, over time, Alamancy diluted in power through through the ages and the generations to the point where Misting started to be born, and then that became more common than, that, than being a Mistborn, but when did that happen? Is that how it works? Or... Had there always been more mistings than Mistborn? In that case, why weren't there always pharynx and ferrochemists? I don't really understand how this works. <laughs> I find it a bit confusing. Um, um, I know it's how this works from an investiture standpoint as well. Like, Farrakhamis used to have all the powers. Does this mean originally all Alamancers were Mistborn for a time until the power diluted and misting started being born? And Farrakhamis was just further behind on that track and so eventually Farrakhamis started to become like Mistings as Farrings. Also what is the origins of Farrakhami? I My assumption was that it's an investiture, investiture of both Ruin and um, of both Ruin and Preservation. I don't know if that's confirmed anywhere, that's just a theory I've had. Um, or it may be something I read in the first trilogy and I don't remember and that's why I think it's a theory I had. But it makes sense because it's preservation You basically creates power. Hemology destroys to create power. And Farrakhemi does neither. It just takes power from one place and puts it to another. So in a way it's of it's it's both of those magic systems in how it works. Um, so that makes sense, but if that's the case, and it's been a, has it just not been around for as long as Alamancy? Also, has Alamancy always been a thing? This is a thing that really confused me in the original trilogy, right? It's implied that Elendi was a seeker, so he was a misting. Where did the first mistings come from? Did people always have Alamancy? Because I thought Alamancy came from when the Lord Ruler gave Lorazium to the Mistborn. I didn't think it was a thing. Before... Reshek... Ascended. But we know for a fact Farrakhemi existed before Alamancy in that respect. Because the Terrasmen were Farrakhemists and they used it to survive the harsh environments of Terrace. So that must mean that farrakhemi has been around since... Before Alamancy, or at least before Mistborn, because they were using it in the time before the Lord Ruler. So shouldn't it have diluted and split up like Mistborn did into Mistings earlier? Shouldn't Fairings have always been a thing? I don't know, I find the whole thing a bit confusing. Um, if someone knows the answer to this, can you put it in the comments if you somehow have watched this video to this point? 
I don't know how this works, it makes my head hurt and is confusing and I think a little bit contradictory. I'm sure there is a answer out there somewhere, but I just don't really get it. So that's kind of a problem I had and I think it's one of those examples of an idea that's presented and not properly touched upon. It's kind of important I think from the, un the standpoint of understanding adv investiture as a concept. Um, and then there, the other issue I have is the existence of Harmonium and Trellium, yet not a single fucking person has ever tried to burn the metal, and we still have zero fucking clue what it does from an Allomancy standpoint, which annoys me because it's been, si the Harmonium or Et Metal has been around in, um, Elendel, or in the Basin, having been purchased from the Malwish for at least six years after the events of the Bands of Mourning, okay, as of the beginning of the Lost Metal, right? With I, I, my understanding of God Metals were that you don't have to be an Alamancer to burn them because you can burn Lerasium without being an Alamancer, because you have to burn it to become an Alamancer, but you can't burn things until you're an Alamancer. So the only explanation there is that Lerasium can be burned regardless of if you're an Alamancer or not. Now maybe that's just Lerasium, but logically you should also be able to burn Atium <laughs> whether, you're a, um, whether you're a Mistborn or not with that same logic. Which doesn't make sense, I guess, now that I'm thinking about it. So maybe it's just that you do need to be a misting of a god metal or a, or a mistborn who can burn every metal to be able to burn a god metal. Okay, let's assume that's the case. You need to be either... a Lara uh, Larasium's the exception, and for all other god metals, you either need to be a misting of that god metal, which would be really unfortunate, or... A um, or a misborn. Okay, that makes sense. So with that assumption, it still makes zero fucking sense, and nobody knows what it does because in the first book, it's literally shown to us that you don't need to consume a metal to burn it from Alamancy for Alamancy to work right. It can be stabbed into you. So with with Miles, he burns gold that's pierced into his body. Right, he doesn't. That's one of his advantages. He doesn't need to swallow gold to use it because he can pierce himself with metal and then heal around it and still be fine because he's a gold compounder, right? But the fact that he's a gold compounder is kind of irrelevant. If you were wacky and crazy enough, you could get a steel sword and shove it through your arm and burn it in theory to steel push. If you were a crazy motherfucker or you were desperate and you really needed metal, you could get a metal knife and stab yourself in the stomach. You could do that. Not even in the stomach, in the arm. And then you can, in theory, burn it. Right? So, here's my question. With all of these things accepted and agreed upon, as of the books. <laughs> Why the fuck does nobody know how wh what happens when you burn Harmonium? Okay? I understand there are no Mistborn, but it can't be that hard to find a Misting. Because here's all you would have to do, logically, to, um, to find a Harmonium Misting. Um... And I'm not a scientist or a super clever person. Just based on my understanding of Alamancy, this is what you would be able to do. Okay? Uh, you could take a harmonium needle or spike. Um, right? So, you know when you're injected with a needle, it is medically an, a medically insignificant wound. Right? It hurts, but it's not going to harm you. Okay? And you can actually get rid of the pain of being being stabbed with a needle with local anesthetic, which we're pretty sure exists in these books, because the characters have surgeries to have metal put inside their bodies. Unless they're super badasses who are like biting down on a leather on a belt and just letting them go fucking like just shove metal under their flesh without anesthetic, we have to assume, or at least I will be assuming because I think it makes sense, that local anesthetic is a thing, okay? And it can't be that hard to get. So, here's all you need to do to test for a harmonium misting. You get a harmonium needle, okay? Then, you get a person, and you put some local anesthetic on them, then you stab the needle inside of their body, okay? And you ask them to try and burn it, and then you do this with 1,000 people. 
And then you just keep doing it until you find a harmonium misting. And then when you found the misting, they burn it and they find out what the fuck it can do. Why can't, why can't, why haven't there been any harmonium mistings? I don't understand <laughs> why this doesn't exist yet. And, and uh, the only thing I can think of is that that small amount of metal from a needle is not allomantically significant enough to burn, but that can't be correct. Because the metal that they burn in allomancy are tiny flakes that they shave off of massive bars of metal. And eat. And that lets them do loads of allomancy for, for, for like an hour without any problems. Or at least for like an intense period. Short period of time. Which would still be plenty to test whether or not it exists. Or how it works. It's been six years and nobody's thought of this. Also, I suppose it's possible that because harmonium is harmonium is um, unstable. If it mixes with water, it explodes. But you can put it in things and it won't explode. Also, it must have to be quite a bit of water because there's water on your hands. There's water in the air and it doesn't explode. And everyone's running. People are running around with these little at metal grenades that aren't exploding, even though they're made of at metal. So clearly, it needs a lot of. Uh, sorry, at metal is harmonium, um, and I keep switching between them. Surely, you need a little bit, quite a bit of water to make harmonium explode. So there is quite a lot of water in a human body. So maybe swallowing harmonium would cause it to explode. I suppose it's possible. In that case, it does make sense that there aren't any that nobody knows what harmonium does when you burn it because nobody wants to explode by swallowing harmonium. Fair enough. Maybe someone did try and swallow harmonium and explode, and maybe that's why we don't know. Um, I don't know. But people touch harmonium. Your stomach has acid in it, not water. But I don't know what percentage saliva is water. So maybe there's enough water in saliva to cause it to explode. So that would make sense, maybe if you swallowed it. But then, how much, how much water would be required to make it explode if you put it into your arm, somewhere where there, where there, it's not coming into contact with any blood, which you could do. Is and clearly there's not enough water in just flesh to cause it to explode because you can touch harmonium. So. You could still do this in theory. You just have to be a bit more careful about it. Um, and you could still burn it without swallowing it. So I'm not sure if I'm convinced this doesn't make any sense. Maybe I'm just missing something. I could be missing something. Um, my other issue is trellium. What happens when you burn trellium? Um, this one is less of an issue because... Uh, Trillium's only discovered early in, but I feel like the set, with all their experimentation, would have tried to find out what happens when you burn it. Um, but we don't know. I suppose none of the none of the characters that the books are on the perspective of would know what it makes sense. They they wouldn't know. But um, this may just me not understanding it enough. I understand that how. Uh, Harmonium is volatile, but characters touch it all the time, and they get it out, and it's, I don't know, uh, wax gets it out and heats it up, so it can't be so volatile that you couldn't just, like, stick it in some oil, take it out of the oil, stick it in someone's arm for a couple seconds, see if they feel anything, just pull it out, stick it back in the oil, I don't know. I'm sure there's a perfectly good reason for it, but it's just it just annoyed me a little bit. Uh, mostly because I just feel like we should know what the fuck it does. But uh, that's that section. That's me finishing my 20 minutes of me moaning about some things that I thought were inconsistencies. Now, these are just things that occurred to me. It's very possible these were explained by Brandon Sanderson outside of the books as to why things are the way they are. And maybe it's my lack of understanding. Um, that's very much possible, but nonetheless, these are things that bugged me about the books. Not big deals at all, because even if they are the case, I don't really care that much, but it just kind of bugged me. Um, general, generally, the uh, 
magic system in these books is watertight and there aren't really many plot holes with it, I don't think. So, you know, you expect there to be a few. I'm fine with there being a few holes in magic systems and stuff like that. I don't think it's realistic, fair or reasonable to expect authors to come up with every single possibility. They are inevitably one person writing a story. They're ba they can give stuff out to beta readers, but beta readers might not catch the shit either, and it's so typical of these things to only be caught once they go out into the general population and thousands of people read the books. So, you know, not to be too harsh on Brian Sanderson here. Obviously, I think that these books are great, and his magic system of all three of his magic systems, Hemology, Ferrochemy, and, Al and Al Alamancy, are great. Um, these are just things that I noticed that I thought were worth mentioning and bugged me a little bit while I was reading these books. That's enough for that section, I think. Another thing that bugged me a little bit was some stuff about the political conflict going on in Ellendale. Now, ultimately, the, politic the political conflict of the setting rubbed me up the wrong way a little bit. Um... It is realistic, and the, in the grander scheme of things, um, I couldn't help but feel that the main characters are kind of on the wrong side, um, because Ellen, they're basically fighting to uphold the unjust political structure of Ellendale exploiting the rest of the basin financially, and therefore all the people that live in the basin, and that's not even including the roughs. Um, I think that the basin wanting independence in uh from ellendale in context to the fact that they're basically being bled dry financially and being financially fucked by ellendale because El the people in ellendale are greedy cunts uh greedy capitalist cunts basically um was really really interesting and a cool realistic political conflict um and i thought that the basin and generally the people of the basin were justified in having that political view um why should they have to be less prosperous just because ellendale existed first that's not fair that there's no justice there people should be able to thrive and not be taken advantage of and exploited regardless of where they live just because you're born outside of ellendale doesn't mean you should have to deal with being financially fucked by the big guy okay that's wrong that's fucked up um and then i thought it was really ham-fisted to just have that all be because uh because an evil group were encouraging this political turmoil um i i i'm sure that the political turmoil would have existed anyway um but i thought that the the other cities were justified in their hatred of uh dislike of ellendale um, their political advers uh, being a political adversary of the powers that be. Essentially, um, the conflict was one created by the greed and avarice of the one percent in Ellendale, and I just thought that making it maybe Trell just took advantage of that. Um, well, not Trell. The set took advantage of that already existing political. Uh, turmoil, turmoil, but it's kind of implied that they largely caused it. Um, of course, it's just an implication, and what I mean by it's implied is basically um, Edwan always goes on about how much um, the set see, how many operations they have, and basically that they are really the ones pushing the direction of uh, politics in Ellendale. They have a lot of control in Ellendale, so they are ironically causing the problem and then taking advantage of it um which just i just seems thematically shit a bit shit to me because um it's realistic that people rich people in ellendale would want to take advantage of everyone else i mean you see it in the real world uh, capitalism just barely fucking works in the in, in in the modern era um you know every the rich just want to get richer and make the poor poorer and i think that that's that's an accurate representation of capitalism at least it would have been but this kind of involvement uh, involvement of the set with this kind of theme and idea kind of muddies the water a bit and turns what would have been a realistic representation of um capitalist exploitation of basically the other 
in the same way that, say for example, the first world exploits the rest of the world in the real world into kind of a muddied, unclear uh, representation of conflict that didn't seem grey, it just seemed unclear what's really going on, uh, in my opinion. Um, now this, this issue is mollified somewhat. My main issue with this in general was that it felt to me that the rest of the basin was justified in disliking Ellendale and was justified in wanting to break away from it. In my opinion, it is justified to violently fight oppression and I think that depending on how bad things are in some parts of the basin and the roughs, they could be justified in a violent uprising to free themselves from financial oppression. Of course, in this case, it's very unclear what's really going on and in that respect it kind of felt like to me wax and the main characters were backing the bad guy a little bit and that kind of rubbed me the wrong way a little bit it's not that big of a deal ultimately you know that wax is a good person and is try well generally a good person is trying to do the best he can in the situation he can and i'm not saying that it would have been realistic for him to like go and become a revolutionary but i think that the story could have been flipped on its head uh, quite easily and would have been interesting to see that that for that to be the case with um the main characters uh, fighting basically against ellendale rather than for it but i suppose that would have been too similar to the original trilogy maybe so i don't know it's just something that kind of rubbed me the wrong way a little bit i thought that it wasn't very clear what was really going on like the motivations of the set and the powers that be in Elendale were explained well enough that you can see that it's possible that, that things are being manipulated by the set, but it's still not clear whether or not those issues would exist without the set there to manipulate the, politi the political and social fabric. So I thought that was just a bit confusing a little bit sometimes, and it really wasn't clear what was really going on. That being said, Wax does politically oppose um, all of this and take a pro-peace political stance. That is basically against exploitation of the basin in the fourth book, and this did kind of resolve this issue for me, because fundamentally the most important thing is that the characters were doing the thing that made sense for their characters. I always thought Wax was just kind of blinkered, unreasonably, unrealistically blinkered, to do with... The real injustice that's going on in the world and he's kind of but that was kind of part of his character arc i suppose um realizing that there are more ways to do good but um similarly marasi uh with her political aims of rebuilding the justice system from built on incarceration and punishment to one built on rehabilitation and community investment and preventative measures against crime for example um was really great to see uh so that this kind of just completely wiped that problem I had with the books, but it did rub me the wrong way up until the last book, um, in which case I kind of stopped giving a shit about it. Um, but it'd be funny to see in um, Era Three if Scadrill has moved to a rehabilitation-based and community investment-based, you know, preventative measures against crime-based um, kind of justice system. Uh, as, as opposed to the um, incarceration and punishment based uh, justice system that it has in Era 2, which would ironically put Era 3 Mistborn socially far far away and ahead of uh, America <laughs> in, uh, in fucking uh, in Mistborn, even though it's existed for uh, far less time, uh, which would be very funny. Um, but anyway, uh, that's me getting way too political for a fucking series of, of books and my, my, although I do want to talk about my, my views of these books and I do really like politics in books. I know people don't like, think that politics and fiction should be separate. I, I strongly disagree. I think everything is political. If you go outside and you say, this thing is too expensive, that's a political statement, whether you like it or not, because the causes and reasons for that being the way it is are a result of 
the political climate of your country and the political climate of other countries and geopolitics and all these other things. Everything is inherently political. Everything down to disliking this and that. It's political. You cannot remove the politics from war. War is a political thing. You cannot remove the politics from law enforcement as a concept, uh, for example. So these books are inherently political, whether you like it or not. And um, overall, these books did give me thought about um ironically it's i don't think they do anything crazy with the politics um that much but it did make me think about politics a little bit when i was reading it mostly stuff that i already think but it did make me think about it and that is ultimately a good thing so i suppose i've got kind of gone gone a full circle and start praising the books <laughs> when i tried to say that the political conflict i thought was a bit um my my the criticism I'm trying to make here, I know I'm rambling a little bit, is that I thought that it was just a bit unclear what was really going on. Um, and I felt like sometimes the books contradicted themselves a little bit about what was going on. So when they went to New Saran, it seemed like the, pe the, the people of New Saran really didn't like... Um, didn't like... Elendel. Now, it's not clear why this is because they turn up and obviously we know that Elendel is financially fucking um New Saran, okay? Now yeah, you can say that's a realistic reason for the average person to dislike Elendel. Well I don't think that's true because every day in America the government fucks the average person and yet half of them still vote for still vote for the to continue getting fucked. So I don't think that's realistic of a reason. So the most realistic reason that I can see is that the set are stoking political fires, which means that by extension so is Trell. So saying that the people being annoyed, ultimately this kind of comes around to the book saying the people being annoyed about being oppressed only makes sense if an evil god turns up and makes them become violent and anti-establishment. That was kind of how it came across to me, but like I said, it was ultimately, mo I was ultimately, it wasn't that big of a deal, but it just kind of bugged me a little bit, and ultimately, I changed my mind about that. By the end of, well, by ha about halfway through um, the third book, um, and ultimately, fourth book, sorry, and ultimately, um, I think that the characters go on to use their power to try and make the world a better place in a way that we can't really ask anything better of them. Um, people, you know, they're spending their whole lives trying to do good at the end of the day, effectively. And that's, you know, that's... You can't ask any more from someone than that, really. I mean, you shouldn't even ask that much of a person. Um, people should just do a little bit of good every day, and that should be enough, I think. But, um, you know dedicating your whole life to going out and trying to do good every day than maximizing the amount of good you do i think is unrealistic people need time for themselves to do what they want to do so the characters in these books are heroic to the extreme i know it doesn't seem that way because a lot of what wax is doing is political but if you're going out and spending all day every day arguing with politicians and trying to push for good policy and push for a, a world like push for the many versus the few then I think that you're a good guy and I think that if you spend your whole life doing that that's like as good as you could that's you're pretty much as as heroic as you that's as heroic as it gets so um you know in in the real world anyway so I think that the characters ultimately in these books ultimately the theme is one of going out and trying to do good and working within the system that exists to try and do good and I don't think that's a bad theme and a bad political idea to present to people because I do agree with that and I do think that you know although I do think that a lot of places in the world um, the people would be justified in violent uprising um, quite frankly uh, I think America is one of those countries um, where you know if you look at how many people die a year because they don't get medical treatment I mean at what point do you say that is the fault of the government because they refuse to change the way the country is how many how many people and you look at America and you see how many like people get shot by cops and how many how many times do black people have to sit there and get shot by cops before they are justified in deciding to pick up a gun and shoot back at the cops? I think there is a point where it's justifiable to be violent 
at least in self-defense, if not in uprising, to try and stop this from happening continuously, ultimately. But um, the reality is that Pranazans is obviously not trying to present an extreme revolutionary theme here. It's just a theme of being a good person and trying to do the good that you can in the systems that exist. And I do think that's also a great, great way to live your life. I'm not saying that... I'm not saying I like violent uprising. I don't think... I don't like it, and I don't think it's the direction that we should go, but I do think it can still be justified, even if I don't like it. So, um, you know, this is a fucking massive tangent, but ultimately... I didn't like this little political, the, the the kind of, what it felt like was trying to be said with the political stuff going on. It was fine. I mean, I thought it was an interesting statement to be making. I don't even know if Brandon Sanders is trying to make these statements, but I do believe in death of the author. So I do believe in the idea that the themes presented in a book should be determined by you, the reader, and what how you take away from what you've read. I know a lot of people don't like to hear that because that means that it's acceptable for a bunch of people to go and completely misinterpret something. Um, I think ultimately that's what art's about. Uh, people can go and choose to misinterpret the fuck out of... You know, people can go and read... Um, go and read loads of classic books... For example, you know, a fucking conservative conservative ideologue can go and read 1984 and completely misinterpret it and think that it's pro-right wing. For example, they're clearly wrong, but ultimately, I mean, George Orwell's a bit of an, a, a weird example because he was very clearly trying to present a certain theme. But when it becomes more muddy, um, and even in that case, people are free to interpret what they want from the text. The writer should just write what they want, and the writer should try and present what they believe in the text, and hope that other people get it. But if they don't, and they see their own thing in there, that's also great too, because that is the point of fiction, in my point, in my opinion. But um, I'm trying to say here is that maybe that's not what Brandon Sanders was trying to present, but that's what I took away from it. Um, I this is 60 minutes long it doesn't need to be that long I'm going to move on now um ultimately just rub me up in conclusion this this little bit rub me up rub me the wrong way a little bit but ultimately by the end I didn't really care about it um <laughs> basically um that's the political conflict uh, section in the bat it's not that big of a criticism the next criticism is going to be my biggest problem with these books um and this is going to be a political thing, uh, based on my own personal politics, in these books. Um, and this is going to be the last negative point I make about these books before I go on to my conclusion. So, the last thing that I didn't like about these books was I thought the representation of the police forces was not nuanced in these books. I think the representation of the police as the good guys, and more often than not, the average person as the bad guy, um, and the oppressed as the bad guy, was kind of just kind of cringy to me, because um, in my opinion, the idea that the police are the good guys is just unrealistic and patently false. Um, I don't see a world where a police force, like the one in Ellendale, could ever be anything other than awful and exploitative. Um, there will always be good police, and I think the reason for that is because I think, in my opinion, honest opinion, like 90% of people are generally good. They just want to get on. They're just the problem is that they're passive. Um, they're they're good in their own morals and they do have you know they're empathetic and they want the best for most people including themselves but they're passive and they ignore bad things um and i think this is the problem with policing you know is that um people they, it's a small very small percentage of police officers that do really 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 bad shit but the rest of the police officers just let it happen and they ignore it and they cover up for it and they just because they they follow the path of least resistance does this make them bad people no it does make them bad people necessarily but it does make them passive and it does mean that the police system as a whole is corrupt because the system allows bad things to happen um and i think that there's no realistic world 
in which the police, like in Ellendale, exist, and they have the powers that they do. The police in these books have way more power than in real life, than the police do in real life. There is no way that that power will not corrupt the police force into abusing their power on a daily basis. And this is never brought up, ever. is never seen. You never see a bent cop. You never see a corrupt cop. You never see... Um, the police do anything other than the foot than the than the right thing, um, which I just think isn't realistic. One of my favorite series of books is the Dresden Files, and I think the Dresden Files is really good at presenting the idea that police as individuals can be good, but that doesn't mean this policing system as a whole is good. And it's really good at saying Karen, one of the main characters, is a good person, and she's she's a police for the she's a police officer for the right reasons. But she fights against the actual system of policing as much as she does against the bad guys to try and do good. Um, you know, she believes in law and she believes in rules and all these other things and she is the model example of a police officer, of a um, of an agent of the law whilst also accepting and presenting that the police force is still an extremely flawed um, system at the same time. These books do the complete opposite of that. They're like, the police are the good guys, or the police that are main characters in these books that we see are the good guys. The police never get in our way, they never cause any problems, they never do anything wrong, and they always save the day, and I just don't think that's a realistic or nuanced representation of policing. Not to say, like I said, that Brandon Sanderson is in any way, shape, or form obligated to represent a nuanced view of the police. I think it's fine to have a series of books where your characters are just heroic and they happen to be police officers. I think that's fine. Ultimately, I think that's fine. It just rubbed me up the wrong way because of my own personal politics, and this is why I'm, why I'm putting it in the bad section. Ultimately, this video is about the things that I liked and disliked about these books. It's a diary of sorts. Um... And for me, um, this was a blemish on these books, and I think it's a bit of a shame. I always think it's a bit of a shame where you get books where the main characters are police officers and they never they never touch on the nuance of policing, because policing is obviously a big political issue right now, but it's always been a big political issue. Um, and I think that there was there were opportunities for some of the villains to be in the police force maybe for um to represent like the police not always being good but also to represent that the vast majority of police officers are trying to do good but the system doesn't necessarily encourage or allow that and also sometimes police officers are forced to do bad things because at the end of the day it is a job and they need to keep their job to feed their families and they want to maintain their career uh, so they just fucking they just ignore the bad shit because at the end of the day it's a job and they're trying to do the best they can. And I do I'm I'm not don't get me wrong I'm not sitting here going like a cab. I do think that a cab is like a perfectly reasonable and justified political view. Um, like I said earlier about um, like how many times in America do black people have to just get shot by Ameri by police officers before they go fuck this we're done we're done with this shit we're just gonna get together and get a bunch of guns and just fucking take the police out i mean is that ju is it is it morally right probably not is it justified you when you look at the statistics i think it probably is justified even if it's morally wrong <laughs> but you know um and this is kind of how i feel about these books from that perspective i'm a pl very political person and i do view politics in everything that I read and do because I do believe that everything is political um, whether despite what people will tell you like oh they're putting pol why are they putting politics in my book why are they putting politics in my game why are they putting politics in my movie motherfucker it's all political it's all political always has been always has been um, and these books are no exception to that that being said I did think these books are really good. <clears throat> um, there is a bit of nuance with Wax just wholesale killing motherfuckers uh, there, but that's just kind of a misborn thing. I do like the moral, the moral kind of eh ism about um, killing. Uh, 
I personally think killing is, is very, 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 very very bad and uh, a lot of fiction doesn't touch enough on the fact that the heroes just fucking kill their way through obstacles in tv shows in movies in in books especially in um in fantasy there's never any attention paid to whether or not each individual person that is killed in the journey of the main characters to win is justified and this is one of the things that I I care about a lot in fiction and I care about it a lot in when I run tabletop RPGs I run Vampire the Masquerade because I really like the fact that there are moral always moral decisions going on every time you hurt someone that can have a mechanical consequence in your character and I like the fact that um, I really like the fact that in D&D, I always run D&D where every combat is optional, no matter what. And a lot of the time, if the characters decide they want to fight their way through people as an obstacle, that will be because they couldn't be asked to deal with it the, pe the peaceful way, essentially. Or they couldn't be asked to sacrifice enough for peace. Um, I always make it so it's possible for them to pay or you know, go through effort and put themselves at risk to get through something peacefully. And ultimately, what does that say about you as a person? If you, you would rather kill five people to get through a door than pay, them a th than pay them five gold because you don't want to spend the money, what does that say about what you think about the value of that person's life? And these books are kind of refreshing because they don't have any of that. They don't have any of that. Wax does, does have a significant amount of introspection in these books about how many people he kills and he doesn't like killing and that is one of the things that he comes to accept about himself later on when he when he does his final blaze of glory he does say to harmony never ask me to do this again because he kills a lot of people he's like never ask me to do this again basically i will never kill like this for you again um and I do think, I do like the fact that killing is kind of treated as a bit brazen in these books because I felt like it really fit. Um, really fit with Era 1 especially because the society in Era 1 is just brutalized. Um, violence is a daily thing. Scar get killed on a regular basis. Death and anguish is part of life and why should the Scar see killing as any different to the way the nobles kill them so it makes sense in that setting and then it was really cool in this setting that um now that human life has a bit more value and people aren't there's laws and people aren't just allowed to be killed people do have rights um the characters think a bit more about killing people um i thought that was cool but i also thought ultimately wax being a paladin and just shooting motherfuckers all the time was also cool but it also at the same time bugged me because he's a police officer and you shouldn't just go around shooting people if you're a police officer but look this is the kind of thing that makes these books good it makes you think and makes you discuss and makes you talk about these things and i like that ultimately but like i said the political elements of these books did rub me the wrong way a little bit um Whereas, like, I really liked the political elements of the f of the first trilogy, but I think that's just because it aligned a bit more with my views on the world. So, not to say that this is bad. Uh, I mean, if you're like a blue lives matter motherfucker, you'll love this book. You'll love these books. You 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 probably love watching cops shoot people who you know you see a. Uh, those YouTube videos of like cops that just like shoot anyone who like so much as like flinches at them and then they'll just be like in the comments like defending the cop like ah, you mother hey, he flinched and technically legally you're not supposed to be able to do that you know you'll love this shit you'll love it but um for me I uh I it just kind of rubs me the wrong way a little bit but yeah that I think that's natural um That's all I have to say about the bad of these books. Uh, and to be honest, I do want to make a little disclaimer at the end saying the bad things I think about these books, they're pretty, they're very minor. Um, they're kind of nitpicks almost because these did, did, this didn't bug me enough for me to really be aware of why it bugged me. I had to sit down and think for a while why it bugged me to understand why something about these books is bugging me a little bit um but ultimately the things that bugged me were completely drowned by my enjoyment so you know i've basically 
put these bad things in here because I feel like I have to to make a more balanced over. I have to try and to be as honest as possible about how I feel about these books because they are supposed to be a diary um, of sorts. But I, to be honest, it's just, it's just not a big of a deal. So, yeah, that's the bad section. That's the the few things that I didn't like that much. So. I just want to conclude this video by saying that I really fucking liked these books. Um, I don't think they're perfect. I think that they have some weird things going on, obviously, as mentioned. But generally, my criticisms are quite ne quite minimal, you know, nitpicky type things. Um, I really, really enjoyed these books. And... The main takeaway for me from these books is that I'm really, really excited for the next series of Miss Bond books for Era 3. Um, I just think the idea of Era 3 sounds fucking awesome. I work in IT myself, so having a computer programmer be a main character it just seems like a really fucking cool idea in general. It appeals to me personally. Um, I will next be reading the Murderbot Diaries. I've actually read the first one at the time of recording this. And I'm reading the second one. They're not very long. Um, they are novellas. About 150 pages long each. And I might be making some videos on those, perhaps. Once I've done with those, depending on how I feel, I might go on to read The Way of Kings. Now, I know for sure the next Brandon Sanderson book I'm going to read, no matter what, is going to be Way of Kings. Whether or not there will be the next books I read after The Murder of Our Diaries, I cannot say. I have purchased Old Man's War, which is a sci-fi book I would like to read. And I want to start reading the Sun Eater books as well. Um, also, I think... I will be reading Blood and Fire at some point, so there's quite a few other books that are kind of demanding my attention in the back of my head. Um, but I'm fully invested at this point in Brandon Sanderson's books, and I will be reading the rest of them. That includes the secret novels, of course. Um, I know little to nothing about the Stormlight Archives, other than the planet's called Roshar, And there are storms. That's all I know. So, um, yeah. Looking forward to reading that. I've only heard good things about the Stormlight Archives. One of my co-workers is obsessed with them. And she's been trying to get me to read them for a while. So, I will be reading them. Uh, so, the next time I check in with a video about a Brandon Sanderson book. It will probably be the first Stormlight Archive book. They're long enough to justify a video each, I think. So I probably will do a video on each of the books. I would like to make notes as I read through the books in general for when I um, finally make a video on them. But it's just kind of not how I read. I just kind of sit there and I read and I get absorbed in the book and I just read for hours. Um, I'm not really the kind of person who can just like stop reading, start reading. Um, I'm either reading or I'm not, so I don't think I'm really ever going to be taking detailed notes about things. Um, so the book, these videos will always be quite general, you know, quite generally talking about the things I like and dislike about the books. Um, I've been thinking about maybe just removing the negative elements of these videos entirely because I felt like in this book, these books especially, the, the negatives that I felt about them were so minor um, that they were almost not even worth mentioning. And I would quite like to make this channel more than the videos I make on it, more positive than anything. There's so many people on the internet who make videos just shitting on things, just tearing things down, being negative. There's enough of that on the internet. I might just make this series of videos and just call it awesome things about why I really liked, you know, maybe, you know what, I'm going to call this, I'm going to put, make this video have a positive title 
about why I really like I really like these books. So I want to be positive about them. Um, I'm just not going to make videos about books I didn't like, I think. I might just, um, if I do, maybe maybe one day I might like make a list of all the videos, that I've, all the books that I didn't like, and I'll just just say in all this in one video like these are the books I didn't like I'm not gonna go into why I didn't like them I'm not gonna make a video about them I think that'll do yeah I really just don't see the point in making videos about books you don't like there's no point shitting on books that you don't like just just uplift the books you like that's, I think that's what I'll do I think that's what I'll do but I'm not decided. Maybe we'll keep the negative bits in. Maybe if that there's enough negative stuff to say. Perhaps. Anyway, I'm rambling, so... I'm going to finish recording this video now. It's taken me three days. Um, I think I'm getting better at being concise and putting the things that I want to say into the video. Uh, I'm not a good editor. I will be editing these videos as little as possible. So, there might be some cuts, but that's about it. I've made this video over three days. Um, most of it today. I'm fucking exhausted, and my mum wants me to go to the pub to meet up with her, because I've not seen her in a few weeks, so I'm going to go do that. Um, if you took the time to read this, thank you for read read this. Watch this. Thank you for watching. Um, I will be making more Star Wars videos at some point with my Star Wars diary. Uh, kind of put a halt on that just because I read the Mistborn books to take a break and I just kind of got sucked in. So, uh, I, I will slowly but surely read my way through Star Wars Legends. I'm reading the Hud Solo trilogy currently. Um, I'm on the second book. I don't really want to make a video her book but it's been so long that I might have to just make a video on Paradise Snare and just call it a day but we'll see anyway thank you for watching and goodbye <laughs>